Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, dear participants, it is both an honor and a privilege to stand before you today as we embark on this journey of collaboration together. The focus today is the enduring partnership between Sweden and Finland in the context of civil defense and preparedness. We have gathered here at the splendid Hanaholmen, a place that not only symbolizes the bridge connecting our two nations, but also embodies the spirit of cooperation and shared values. This location stands not only as a testament of the enduring friendship between Sweden and Finland, but also a place for fostering space for open dialogue, shared insights and transformative collaboration. The Hanna Holman Initiative, as a platform for discussion and action, plays a pivotal role in the strengthening, strength, strengthening our mutual crisis preparedness. It serves as a model for how two nations can come together, pooling resources, knowledge and expertise to address the complex challenges of the modern world. In this unique and dynamic environment, we will witness remarkable presentations and engage in enlightening discussions together. Our distinguished speakers and participants, hailing both from the private and the public sector, represents the very essence of this collaboration. Being a part of this gathering is not a, just an opportunity, it's a true privilege. It is a chance to learn, to inspire, and to collectively enhance our civil defense strategies. The value of this collaboration goes far beyond the presentations we will hear today here at Hanna Holman. It extends to the partnership forged, the innovative ideas shared, and the friendship that will develop. My name is Minu Sadikpur, and I will be your moderate, moderator here today. We have a packed agenda ahead of us, and we are very excited to delve into critical, critical topics of crisis preparedness, civil defense, and security. So, my friends, as we embark on this enlightening journey together, let us keep in mind the incredible potential of this partnership and the promise it holds for a more secure and resilient future for both our nations. Together, we face the challenges of tomorrow as allies and friends. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I look forward to a day filled with insights and meaningful connections. And with that said, I would like to warmly welcome the initiator of the Hanna Holman Initiative and Hanna Holman CEO, Gunvor Kronman, Please join me in welcoming Gunvar with a warm applaud. So, good morning, everybody, the ministers and their summit delegates, and everybody else. Today's summit marks the culmination of the third year of the Hanna Holman Initiative. We have a saying that describes my feelings this morning, tredje gången gilt, in Swedish, kolmas kerta toden sano, in Finnish. I believe that we have managed to establish the Hanna Holmen Initiative as a serious actor and platform in the field of crisis preparedness. As most of you know, the initiative consists of two parts, an executive education program and a high-level forum, this summit. The idea is that during the education program, the 20 participants will reflect on how we can better pre be prepared and be more resilient when the next crisis strikes. And some of the real value in this is that we gather all sectors of society, private, public, and third sector together. Today we will hear some observations from both participants in this year's course and two alumni from last year. This is an extremely important aspect as one of our measures for success is indeed that the participants continue to keep contact and come up with new collaboration ideas inspired by the program. 
And I understand from discussions yesterday evening that actually already several of these year's participants have long lists and ideas of how to take the collaboration in their sector further. One of the finest examples of such follow-up activities is the security of supply conference that was organized in Sweden this autumn. The idea to arrange this was born during informal discussions at last year's education program between two of our alumni, at least one is here today, Johan Belfrage and Morgan Olofsson. It was a fantastic event hosted by SNS, the Center for Business and Policy Studies in Stockholm, in the presence of the Crown Princess Victoria and Prince Daniel, symbolizing how important this question is. The event in Stockholm also launched this year's Hanna Holmen Initiative Education Program. I'm also delighted and proud that our core partnership has been strengthened by two new organizations, the National Emergency Supply Agency in Finland and the Civil Contingency Agency MSB in Sweden. We're also extremely grateful for the continued commitment and cooperation with the Finnish Security Committee and the Swedish Defense University. Looking at the world today, it's evident that we need this kind of new innovative cross-border cooperation. The close cooperation between Finland and Sweden can also provide a role model and inspiration for other countries, especially in the field of comprehensive security. Comprehensive security, which looks at a society as a whole and critical elements that are required to tackle, for example, the various hybrid threats that we are facing. Therefore, I'm especially looking forward to hearing the presentation of Jörg C., the Deputy Assistant Secretary General of NATO. I'm also extremely pleased to have the voice of the business sector so well represented in our program today something that Marcus Wallenberg underlined during his speech at the first Hanna Holmen Initiative Summit in 2021. On September 20th, we launched the celebration of Hanna Holmen's 50th anniversary period, which will culminate in June 2025. To mark this occasion, we published a new report presenting the status of the relation between Finland and Sweden. It includes a survey carried out amongst the populations in Finland and Sweden. And this survey presents the view of the public on which areas of cooperation our, uh, our public uh, find especially important. The answer is not surprising, but still it delighted us and confirmed that we're doing something that is considered important, relevant and legitimate in the eyes of the citizens. Crisis preparedness was by far number one in both Sweden and in Finland. Before concluding, I want to express my greatest appreciation to the partners already mentioned and the steering group led by the parliamentarian and the chair of the Defence Commission in Sweden, Hans Wallmark. Great thanks also to the fantastic and committed participants in this year's education program and our distinguished summit speakers. I wish us all a very successful and inspiring summit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Gunvor. It is time to kick off today's program with a focus on innovation in civil defense through the collaboration between two nations. Joining us are Yuri Hakemi, CEO of the Confederation of Finnish Industry, and Sweden's Jan Olof Jacke, CEO of the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. And Jan Olof will be joining us via link. And uh, with that said, please uh, give, help me giving Jiri a warm welcome to the stage. Good morning to everyone and good morning to Jan Olof to Stockholm. First of all, thank you for inviting me to this seminar. And uh, first of all, I want to con congratulate Hanna Holmen this excellent initiative, as, as Gunvor explained, what is the purpose of, of doing this uh, deep and close cooperation between Finnish and uh, Swedish uh, people. Uh, as we all know, we are living in the world of crisis. We were just recovering from uh, 
pandemic, when, when Russia decided to do this illegal invasion to Ukraine and, uh, and all these crises, of course, they hit to our, our companies. And, uh, and uh, so this team of, uh, of uh, uh, comprehensive defense is, is, is really important. But I have a couple of slides, and uh, I will show them. But um, I will use this pandemic COVID as, a, as a pilot ex example of what happened. And also, it refers to our Swedish cooperation uh, information sharing. This model, which uh, Kunvor already mentioned, this, uh, the diamond, the Finnish way of uh, doing this work, uh, is, is we are very proud of that. I, I think you can sum up this model that, that in Finland we have a very close and deep cooperation between authorities, public sector, and with business, and, and with NGOs, different kind of organizations. And all these dimension, uh, dimensions in, in, in this diamond are important. And I will comment just a couple of them. First of all, leadership. Uh, we have made, in a way, our report after the COVID, and uh, it's fair to say that Finland survived fairly well uh, uh, of, of the COVID, but of course there are areas to improve. And one thing was that COVID came last to Finland. It, it first uh, appeared in the middle of uh, Europe and then step by step came to Finland. We had more time to prepare. We had more time to have information what went wrong, what, what, uh, what uh, could work. But about the leadership, we feel that in Finland, our concept, uh, the, the uh, uh, preparation, planning and coordination goes well, but concerning the leadership, there are uh, things to improve. And, uh, and uh, we think we, we should have uh, this kind of uh, uh, security council concept as they have in some other countries. This is one of uh, the lessons learned from our side. Then about international and EU activities. The, the global world is, is very strongly interlinked and uh, the, the COVID showed how, how deeply. Every, uh, for example, value chains broke up and, uh, and uh, there were challenges concerning the logistic and uh, different kind of restrictions, etc. And uh, even though it's popular sometimes to criticize the European Union, I would say that in the field of vaccination without EU activity, it wouldn't work. So, so EU is very important for us and our companies and also we had a close cooperation with our Swedish colleague, uh, uh, Svenska Nairisliebet, uh, sharing the information and what worked in, in Sweden and uh, how they did it in Sweden and what we can learn from that. This is our way of, uh, normally we work very closely, closely and uh, sharing in, in, uh, information. Then the economy and infrastructure and security of supply. Uh, this is uh, in a way the core of the Finnish model and, uh, and the role of uh, private sector is very important. And one example is, of course, this uh, national defense course that, uh, that already about 6,000 participants have uh, participated in this course and, uh, and a four weeks course. It's like, like this course in a way and, uh, and uh, uh, combines all the forces in Finland not only the authorities, but also organizations and, 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 and business. So, uh, uh, as I said that, we want to sustain this model as it is. And uh, there are some kind of ideas on, on European level to make new legislation, new directives, but we feel that this kind of uh, model, which is based on the voluntary and, and a voluntary cooperation is, is, is very important. I re remember when I served uh, the Minister of Defense four years from 2007 until two 2011. And when I explained our model to, to the foreigners when I was traveling that in Finland, business people, they, they work voluntary uh, serving the defense based on the reserve. That, for example, expert in ICT, expert in cyber, expert in logistics. And they were really surprised. And this really shows the the, the, the defense will, what we have in Finland. Really, companies, they support their people to do this work. 
Then the, the next uh, slide just uh, goes deeper about the preparedness cooperation forum. And uh, from our side, we feel that the, the, the concept itself works fine, and especially when we are talking about big companies. But if you think about uh, small and medium-sized companies, they don't have that kind of expertise to, to, to predict what kind of uh, uh, accidents or what kind of uh, challenges, the challenges they might have. For that reason, we have, uh, as an organization, the Confederation of Finnish Industries, we have started webinars uh, once a month to our members uh, about different uh, kind of challenges. Last week, we had concerning the energy, because we know that what uh, happened uh, concerning the gas pipeline and the winter is coming, how, what kind of things they should prepare and, uh, and uh, next, thing, next week, uh, no, 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 not the, next week, but next, next webinar will concern about hybrid, uh, what kind of uh, uh, challenges we have in that field. So this kind of uh, training is very important to our members and uh, SMEs, and I'm sure that also in this field there is uh, things to do together with our Swedish colleagues. Minu, I, I think this is from my side, and once again, congratulations on your excellent initiative. Thank you so much. Uh, warm applause for you. <laughs> we are really looking forward to meet you in six months, uh, one year from now, and see how the cooperation between Sweden and Finland will develop in this context. Well, uh, it has been time to welcome uh, Jan Olof. Jan Olof, are you with us? I am indeed. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. Jan Olof, uh, welcome to the Hanna Holman uh, Summit and welcome to the digital room. The digital room is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm sorry I couldn't join you today at the beautiful Hanna Holman, but hopefully the uh, digital world will serve us well. Uh, first, just let me say that I, I very much agree with the uh, jury's uh, initial statements here. And, um, and I think uh, we all, uh, both as organization and individuals, have uh, a different task than we had a couple of, of years ago. And we need to show it not just in talk, but also in, uh, in action. Um, I, I'm sure that having been sitting here a couple of years back, I would not have invested uh, the same amount of time in, for instance, uh, taking a chairmanship of the Swedish non-profit organization Folk och Försvar. I think it would be called sort of People and Defense, um, which is a, a terrific organization bridging military defense and the civil uh, sector. Um, but it's just a, one small example of how we all need to act uh, differently and engage uh, much more. We clearly find ourselves in uh, times of uh, complex and serious security threats, both domestically and internationally. The challenges we face today are evolving at a completely unprecedented pace both from natural disasters, terrorists, cyber threats, and other emergencies are becoming more complex and uh, increasingly more uh, unpredictable. That does take cooperation at many levels. It takes cooperation between the state and the business sector. Uh, I think that is a crucial factor in addressing these challenges. And Swedish enterprise, uh, Sweden, the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise, have been advocating for long the value of a platform where we can uh, share information, share experiences between the state and the business sector. Therefore, we are very, very glad to participate in the uh, recently inaugurated cross-sectorial business council for total defense issues and preparedness. This was initiated by the government and the Minister of Civil Defense, Carlos Gabolin, who will uh, join us a little later at stage, I believe. Um, and the council, I think, has a great, great uh, potential to de develop into something really important for our robustness and, and preparedness. We are still at an early stage. I, I think we should all uh, sort of agree to that, but there is no no question about the potential uh, a collaboration like that can have. 
and I was inspired to see on the diamond that uh, that jury showed uh, the preparedness cooperation forum. Uh, I, I will call you Yuri on that one and and see what we can uh, what we can do also better on the Swedish side. We also participate in uh, a number of uh, government inquiries that aims to establishing new formats for coherent security of supply systems. Uh, and I think the role of, of business community is crucial in the new structure. I think we all understand that, but it's important that we take it really seriously. With strong companies, we also have a much better, uh, much better foundation for a robust preparedness uh, as, as a nation. And there is so much to learn from, uh, from where you are on the Finnish side, when, not least when it comes to the Finnish National Emergency Supply Organization. So number one, cooperation is between state and business sector. Secondly, uh, cooperation between our countries and the uh, business uh, sector in, in our countries is essential. By working together, Sweden and Finland, I'm sure, will be better equipped to tackle the, uh, the challenges. And, and three, we have, we have a long history and shared interests, shared challenges, we have a strong collaboration with EK, the Finnish Confederation of Finnish Industry. Um, in so many other topics, we have a long way to go uh, when it comes to develop it in full in uh, in, in this particular uh, sector of uh, robustness, preparedness. Um, but cross-border business organization uh, cooperation with our friends will be very important going forward. We have uh, started and we have a good starting platform, but I, I think it's fair to say, and I think Yuri would agree with me, uh, we still have a long way to go. Um, but just a couple of brief examples. We, uh, in connection with the NATO discussion uh, a year and a half ago now, uh, we worked very closely with EK. Uh, one of the results was a, a, a shared and joint um, uh, article published in both countries at the same time, which just demonstrates how closely we look at those uh, topics. We also uh, maintain a very regular dialogue with Finnish industry, as well as with our uh, Nordic colleagues, such as Confederation of Norwegian Enterprise, Danish Industry, etc. And at one of our meetings last year, we had uh, we had a very uh, informal and good discussions with the chief of staff of NATO, Stian Jensen. And in only, I think, uh, a month and a half time, uh, we have a new uh, new meeting with our uh, Nordic uh, presidents and uh, CEOs, where uh, this topic will again be on the agenda. So I just would like to uh, say a couple of words uh, uh, on the uh, uh, key role of business. Uh, a robust and res resilient society requires not only military defense that is strong, but also a strong business sector. This might seem obvious uh, to many of us, but the insight is crucial. Uh, Companies form the foundation of the, uh, the civil part of the total defense system. And this means that building, uh, building security requires understanding of market conditions and, uh, and strong companies help us build strong resilience. Finally, uh, Sweden has a lot to learn from Finland when it comes to, for example, food supply. We import uh, more than 50% of our food, significantly more than Finland does. Does that mean we should uh, have an aim to become more self-sufficient nationally? Maybe, maybe not. But it does uh, serve as a reminder to us that uh, we need to plan for how to, in a crisis, main, uh, in a crisis maintain international trade, secure transportation, uh, secure transportation roads and plan together with our like-minded friends. I spent 20 years in big pharma industry and uh, for me that was a very, very clear example of what we can learn from, from Finland. We have taken very different paths over the last 25-30 years uh, and you are well ahead of us but we will do our best to 
catch up a little, uh, but also to, to, to work very closely uh, together. And I think there is every reason to strengthen the business sector collaboration to jointly enhance our defense capabilities. The NATO membership also offers significant opportunities for both our countries. And it's important to remember that it's not only our defense forces that have joined or will, in our case, join NATO. It's our entire country's societies, including our businesses. So every reason for a continued and enhanced strong collaboration between countries, between business organizations across countries, and uh, whilst we start from a good point of collaboration, we have a lot more to do when it comes to collaboration on these particular issues uh, between Sweden and Finland and, and specifically between uh, EK and, uh, and uh, Confederation of Swedish Enterprise. But we should further enhance our cooperation and I think maybe a joint dialogue between our organizations and our governments could be a, a good start of such a, a strengthened future. Thank you and I look forward to any uh, question you may have. Thank you so much, Jan Ola, for joining us at the Hanna Holman Summit. And thing, I, we are really looking forward to see a lot of concrete examples of how uh, the Confederation of Finnish en Industries and the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise will develop ahead. Do you have any any dreams for the cooperation, if you could wish? If, if, if I could wish, uh, I, I guess... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, well, I, I spontaneously have two wishes and dreams. One is that we would catch up very quickly on the, Swe on the Finnish uh, security of supply system you have. Uh, we have a lot to learn there. And, and, and the second wish is, um, and if you have three, the, the second is that our uh, cross-sectorial uh, platform will develop into something that looks similar to, to the Finnish one. Uh, the potential is significant. And number three would be, uh, if you ask me the same question of specific example, one year from now, we would be able to give you significantly more tangible examples of what good collaboration could look like. So I will hold both you and Yuri on that. So in one year from now, I will ask you the same question. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Jan Olof. Well, it's time to move on in the program and take uh, the advantage to listen to some real life examples. First of all, we have Jarna Hartikainen, Head of Preparedness Planning at the National Emergency Supply Agency. She is here to share insights into common stockpiling practice. We have Edwin Resebo, CEO of Amexi, who will showcase modern and innovative technology that enhances crisis preparedness. Please join me in welcoming both Edwin and Jarna to the stage. Yes, please. Uh, uh, you, you have the click here. So. So, uh, Jana, let me start by turning to you the floor, and the word is yours. Thank you for uh, joining us here, and it's been I've been attending this uh, Hannah Holman Initiative this uh, autumn, and it's been really pleasure, and I've learned so much about it, and it's really inspiring to kind of take these forward. And today I'm focusing on the developing of international security of supply in practice, and uh, what we've been doing uh, from the national perspective in Finland for, uh, tens, uh, decade, for several decades. And um, uh, uh, what we like to kind of uh, understand in the big, the big picture that uh, the uh, stockpiles are one uh, element in the toolbox that covers our broad range of possible ways of uh, how we can do public-private co uh, collaboration and preparedness in action. Uh, we do uh, a lot of development where stockpiles are kind of one uh, key element, but also trainings and exercise where we can learn what we actually need, how we can prepare, how we can help the uh, private sector to uh, uh, 
secure the civil society, uh, what kind of investments we actually need, what kind of situation awareness can help us to make the best decisions uh, when forecasting the future, but also on the daily life, that what we act and uh, kind of we need to take into action from our toolbox when the situation comes. And one of the uh, cases is just a couple of weeks ago when we have this Baltic connector and telecommunications cable uh, cut down in the Baltic Sea. Uh, we also need strategic partnership and cooperation that who we collaborate when the real situation comes. Do we need uh, what, kind, uh, what uh, companies are in this exact uh, situation? But to prepare, prepare for that, we also need to know what the international parties are who might be involved so we can immediately start the cooperation. So preparedness is a very key essential part when we think what actually needs to be in place and how stockpiles can kind of support this whole uh, picture of preparedness. Uh, tra traditionally, our material preparedness ha has been uh, very much focused on three key elements. Our state-owned reserved stockpiles, uh, which are kind of the uh, protecting the livelihood of the population when the, uh, there's a really severe crisis ongoing, and it's based on the law. Then we have the compulsory stockpiles, uh, which could be uh, kind of described to be uh, serving us during a severe interruptions in import. So another way to a, a bit different kind of scenario. And it's also based on the law that when is this taken into action and how it's prepared. And the third level is security of stockpiles, which is protecting the livelihood of the population and manufacturing during the interruption of supply of crucial raw materials. And that's also based on the law. But uh, we've taken a bit more a broad view in the, in the future that uh, in the next slide is presented that there are multiple ways uh, to have a more kind of comprehensive toolbox in the future, that which ways we can secure when it comes to energy supplies, uh, food supplies, what actually perhaps the... Uh, uh, let's say logistics needs, what does the IT, ICT sector needs are, what is the health sector needs. So basically, uh, because all the uh, sectors are really independent, we need to see what, what are the actually uh, the whole, let's see, put the whole toolbox uh, from just uh, uh, single materials to the way we can produce and uh, secure that we can produce for a long time things that we actually need in a crisis and what uh, different ways there are. And it, we have some that are really company driven, what are daily, uh, in companies' daily lives are important, what the companies take the care of them because of their own risk analysis. Then comes the public private collaboration where uh, said investments and production reservations come into place, for example. And then is the heavy part of regulation based, where authority activities, state owned companies, and mandatory activities for companies are in kind of in place. So it kind of goes from the very extreme case to more like the disturbance on every day and what kind of levels we can do uh, together. But when it comes to securing this in Finland, we also uh, want to, because we are working in the global context, we have this critical Nordic flows study on what kind of uh, uh, supplies we actually have in common that are uh, in, for the, all the Nordic countries and what we can there kind of expand our knowledge and actually take it into practice uh, uh, how we can secure the supplies together with the Nordic countries and especially in this bilateral collaboration with Sweden. And I can just uh, say that we are, uh, when it comes to practice, just thinking about starting a project or study how we can uh, take it uh, uh, from the law requirements pers perspective and location perspective, thinking about how we can, for example, have energy supplies or stockpiles in Sweden that support both countries, perhaps, in the future. 
But a very practical example of these international stockpiles is our RESC EU um, uh, 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 stockpiles, which we are just building up and it's really inspirational and we are learning a lot from it, which we started just a year ago and are now building up as EU Commission granted us money for Finland for the development of the first RESC EU chemical, biological, radio logical and nuclear strategic reserve. And it's a collaboration between several authorities in Finland and which we are learning a lot from right now and what kind of materials are needed and how should they be placed and stored in Finland and how it can be delivered among the EU countries uh, in the future uh, across well all the EU member states and uh, also possibly outside Europe as well. What we've uh, kind of learned so far and then what kind of capabilities we need and what we're actually building up right now is the materials and how they should be placed, what kind of strategic partnership we actually need to execute this, um, how the materials should be managed, uh, how we can meet the requirements to meet that uh, uh, on time. Uh, what kind of training and practices we actually need. So this stockpiling actually goes through the trainings and uh, 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 practices and exercises level as well. So we can't kind of separate them. They all are uh, attached to each other. And I think this risk EU case is really important for the EU, but it's really a good way to learn how we can uh, succeed in this Nordic cooperation as well in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Edwin, please uh, take the stage. And Jarna, when Edwin prepares, I have a question for you. Usually when I have a Finnish colleague or friend on stage, I ask them what they can provide Sweden in terms of knowledge and, and cooperation. But uh, today uh, I want to switch the perspective and uh, so my question to you is you have touched upon the cooperation between Sweden, I noticed the book with the Nordic flows and you have talked a lot about stockpiling. Can you give a concrete example of what you as in your capacity has learned from Sweden in the cooperation? Is it, yes, this is working. Uh, I think uh, it's really interesting to see what the, uh, our uh, Swedish colleagues are interested in because uh, because Sweden is kind of coming can uh, think about them from the beginning. Mm -hmm. We have several things that we can actually kind of we need to re, uh, uh, re <laughs> uh, think how we actually need to do in the new times as the supply chains is and chain uh, chains. Uh, uh, kind of evaluate and uh, differ from the, uh, what we've planned them for like 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and we have to renew them. So I think there are a lot of things that actually Swedes can do faster and we can learn from them and what ideas there are behind. And we, I think that this takes us to that. We, if we are not really following what Sweden is doing, we might be behind very soon. <laughs> So that's why we are really into doing this together and thinking about it together. Yeah. That's great. Please uh, stay here with me. Edwin, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests. It's uh, extremely scary being here as a Swede talking about uh, security of supply in Finland. Uh, I must say that uh, keeps me on my toes uh, throughout this presentation. But uh, I will do the best I can and uh, maybe just uh, mentioning a few words about Amexi for those of you who aren't familiar with what kind of company we are. So uh, we were actually founded in 2017 on initiative by Marcus Wallenberg, who I guess uh, most of you know who that is. And the idea was really based on a feeling that we are falling behind in terms of adopting new manufacturing technology in our Swedish industries, or I should say Nordic industries, because the companies that came together and founded Amexi in 2017 are indeed Nordic 
industries. So you can see kind of the, the range and the, the breadth in terms of the um, industrial applications that we are working on on a daily basis. And I mean, initially when we set up, uh, I mean, it wasn't clear that we were gonna expand into Finland, but we realized that there is actually a real relevance in being close to, I mean, the Finnish industries and the needs that are here in Finland. So uh, two years ago, we set up a subsidiary in Tampere in Finland, which is also set up with a production capacity. So that has the possibility to support companies in research development and really finding good uh, cases. And I mean, this type of production technology requires a very specific uh, infrastructure. It's very capital intense in terms of the technology and the machines that you need to do this. And initially when we started, I mean, the idea was not that uh, we were supposed to work with security of supply. That was not really the idea. It was about working with engineers and finding very smart uh, new solutions on very complex products, etc. But what's the, the beauty of this technology, or as at least as we like to see it, I mean, it's not about printing plastic parts. It's really about printing really big metal parts these days. So you can see the technology we're basically using a fiber laser and fusing metal powder into a solid metal, which is as strong or stronger than cast or wrought material. And this opens up completely new possibilities. I mean, imagine being able to print an entire engine block for a truck or similar, or a missile body for a very specific application where it becomes crucial to own this IP and also own the sort of production capacity because that gives you the flexibility to also produce what it is that you need in, in terms of a crisis. And that's what's good with this technology because you can mobilize it very fast. So, I mean, you can just see uh, another example of something very complex that, that we could manufacture using this technology. And, I mean, if we look at it from a very basic point of view, I mean, if you have a production network that operates with this type of technology, and the input, kind of the, the feedstock that we need is metal powder, and that metal powder you can then utilize for, I mean, if you want to use something for a truck, for an aircraft, for whatever. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a military application. It can also be a civil application. And I think we've seen some really good examples where this can be used. So this use case is actually on the Saab Gripen fighter, which arguably is the, the best fighter in the world. Uh, and I mean, <laughs> I'm not biased at all in this case. So we cannot for our life understand who, who would buy something else than <laughs> this amazing aircraft. Uh, and I mean, the idea in terms of the supply chain, I mean, it's, it's very simple. I mean, there are a lot of crucial parts on these aircrafts which gets damaged when you're in the forward operating base. And having an aircraft on the ground is extremely expensive, especially when you are being in a situation where you need the aircraft. So how can we solve some of these very simple issues and get the uptime on the aircraft? So in this case, it was about, okay, can we take a damaged hatch on the exterior hull of the aircraft? Can we scan it, print it, mount it, and then get the aircraft up in the air again within a span of 24 hours? And what's even more controversial in this case, it's replacing the metal part with a polymer part. And I mean, it sounds ludicrous. I mean, could you really do that and, and get uh, an aircraft up in the air again? Well, I mean, the basic kind of idea around this is very simple, but you see the white patch on the, the rear end of the Gripen Fighters aircraft hull. And that is actually a 3D printed polymer part that is flying uh, in a real life scenario. So this really is a game changer in terms of how we get uptime on our equipment. Because in the end, I mean, the fighter pilot in this case doesn't need, I mean, 300 hours of operation. Maybe you need 20 hours or whatever just to get the aircraft up. 
And it sounds very simple. I mean, from a, from a basic perspective, it's about, okay, scanning, printing, mounting it, and getting it up. But if we look at the regulatory side of this, I mean, it took us three and a half years from the, the first scan and test to get the airworthiness approval for this hatch. So three and a half years, 13 airworthiness approvals later from LFV, the Swedish Luftfartsverket, and also approval from the pilot, because, I mean, the, the pilot is in command in the end and uh, doesn't want uh, whatever mounted on the aircraft. But the only requirement from the pilot was to choose something behind the air intake in case uh, things went south. So that is a military application, and, and I mean, in 2020 something happened that uh, I think again showed the case showcased a lot where Sweden stands in terms of readiness uh, in a crisis. Uh, and this really struck our civil society in a way which was really um, mind-blowing for us. And I mean, we are an industry. We work with serving our customers on a need-by-need -need basis. So you can see this uh, picture with uh, a doctor with a uh, overhead film taped in her forehead. And this was published in the Swedish national newspaper, and they were basically calling for help and saying, can, can someone find something that is better than this? Because this doesn't work, and we need a lot of these things. So we contacted the region Sörmland, and in one week we have gone through 23 versions of this kind of visor, which we could print, go up to the doctors, sit with them, and they could evaluate it, test it. Then it was the matter of actually um, yeah, producing this at a larger scale. So if you look at it, I mean, where we started with these early prototypes going from having a capacity of delivering 1,000 per week to delivering 110,000 per week. So the final shipment in the end there, the final stage, we had a 24-meter lorry coming and picking that up. And that is a scale up in six weeks from doing these initial printing tests. And along that road, we also switched from 3D printing to injection molding. So we went from 3D printing as the starting point and then morphed into a conventional supply chain because that's the only way to meet the demand on, on that scale. And I think as, I mean, what, what was surprising for us, as I said, I mean, this is not our main business, but it went from seeing this to before I had my morning coffee, I had at least one person from a, a municipality or a region calling us and saying, how much can you deliver? Uh, because we need this, this and that. And it becomes very tricky for us as an industry to kind of see, okay, how do we uh, deliver on this? So, I mean, the, really the challenges was understanding what is the actual need? How much do we need to produce? Uh, and also, I mean, who do we turn to? Because actually, I mean, we are being targeted by a lot of public uh, organizations, but we don't know who's in charge, who, who is actually the one putting the demand on us so we can understand that. The solutionizing factor for us was when we got in contact with the command center that was set up on Karolinska in, in Stockholm. Because then we had a clear voice, a speaking partner that said, okay, but this is what we need right now. And we want you to focus on this. And that was really uh, a key important thing for us as an industry to understand where we can play a role in all of this. So that's just shortly what I want to say about that. We're also expanding our operations in Sweden. So we're doing a huge investment now to further specialize and, and become a kind of key uh, player in the defense and aerospace sector. So any questions on that? Thank you so much, Edwin. Please take seat next to Jana. Jana, uh, from um, a NASA perspective, do you believe that this type of technology that Edwin is representing will be crucial for the stockpiling process in the future? Uh, I think it's really a good way to kind of have this ability to adapt to different kind of situations. So it's definitely one kind of aspect we need to look into. Of course, we have to kind of see what is that actually companies need and is that they do in, in their daily life, in their daily uh, production, and what is actually the needs that 
we need in crisis and how we can collaborate in them and what, can, what does that mean. So it's not a kind of easy situation to do and contract and hey, let's do this, but definitely an aspect that we need to look into and it's one possibility of solving some manufacturing problems in the future. Yes. Edwin, do you believe that the flexibility that your company stands for and represents will be crucial for the public sector, both in Finland and Sweden? I mean, sometimes uh, the public sector is not as fast going uh, as uh, the enterprises. No, but I, I, if you've asked me three years ago, I probably would have said like, mm, maybe. Um, but today it is a different situation and I mean we see how our, we are also I mean involved in now more and more of the delivery supply chain to Ukraine for example where we can also clearly see that having this flexibility and meeting demands fast it plays a crucial role and this technology has a possibility to do that but what needs to be done is really a proper inventory. Because today, I mean, a lot of the systems that we operate on, they were designed in the 60s, 70s, and the information, the data behind that, it's around, I mean, it's on 2D drawings. And to be able to feed it into this process and own the kind of IP around it, you need to digitalize that. And you need to understand, okay, which are our top 200 <laughs> items that we would need in a crisis. And this inventory is not done. It doesn't exist. So even today, if you came and said, okay, we need 200 of this, the pre-work would be pretty intense. So there needs to be resources set aside and, and a focus to really, okay, what is our top picks here in terms of a crisis? And then you can mobilize that fast. But if it isn't there, then you kind of, you have the engine, but not the fuel. Yeah, and the pand and pandemic example is very uh, crucial for that perspective. Yes. Uh, we have time for one question from the audience. So uh, if anyone has a question, I know that we have a lot of competence in the audience as well. So please feel free to raise your hand. Everybody is tired. <laughs> okay, uh, let me then summarize. How would you, Jarna and Edwin, see that the cooperation between uh, NESA and Amexi can develop in the future, if you could wish? Yeah. Very good question. Uh, I think we need to kind of have a discussion on what are their capabilities and what are what are actually the needs. And we also need to search for the what are actually is the needs that um, the uh, private sector has. Mm -hmm. And maybe as um, uh, mentioned that we cannot really make the uh, like say the supply chains are. Uh, nowadays, though, that you can't really make good that good list on, for example, what ICT needs, what the logistics needs, because the list, if you make in a couple of years, it has probably changed. How we can make a kind of agreement or what, uh, what is the capability of serving in different situations and how we can kind of uh, make those limits and the flexibility? I think those are the questions which takes uh, forward in the discussions. Yes, that's great. Edwin, any short comments? Yeah, I would say, I mean, uh, it's uh, not a singular company's task to, to do this, but if you are able to connect all the companies that are working with this technology in Sweden and in Finland, you actually get a pretty strong production network. And I think that's in the end the key factor there to look at it, not from a singular company perspective, but look at it entire capacity that we have in the Nordic region, and then it becomes a powerhouse. Mm. And I, I must say I totally agree with you on the Gripen fighter. <laughs> Great, right? Thank you so much, Jana and Edwin. Now it's time to welcome two very distinguished alumni from the Hanna Holman Initiative. They will share their experience and insights from collaboration and project inspired by participating in the program. So please welcome Johan Belfrag, Director of Innovation and Business Development at Saab, and Katarina Kandolin, Cybersecurity Expert at OP Financial Group. A warm applaud. <laughs> Thank you.
Johan, let me start by turning to you. You are both former participants in the program. Please uh, tell us what was the best part of the program when you were a, a participant? All of it. All of it. <laughs> now, um, first of all, a great pleasure being here again. And it was a great honor being part of uh, the program. Uh, for me, I think it was a, a great sort of learning experience and a personal growth journey mm -hmm. uh, in many aspects. Um, I think both how the course was structured, that it was very much fast paced and that you were actually challenged by all the organizations that you had the opportunity to visit uh, with real, real cases mm -hmm. to work on. And I think that sort of gives it... Um, a real educational purpose that, that you grow with the challenge that you are put forward with. So that was, a, for me, a really, um, really interesting and, and um, sort of a good experience. Um, and secondly, of course, the whole network uh, that we still, still are in contact today through a WhatsApp thread. Um, I uh, texted <laughs> Katarina the other day regarding an issue. Um, so I think sort of Creating a program that is very sort of anti-silo, which I think the Hannah Holman initiative is really about, where you work cross-functional, that was very inspiring and something that I uh, hope that we can do even better in our daily operations. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, it seems like the Hannah Holman initiative, the essence of this is the anti-silo perspective. Do you believe that you can, uh, I mean, you can take it back uh, with you to your home organization and apply it on the Saab context? Uh, I mean, a absolutely. I think uh, all organizations need to be uh, sort of better regarding that. Yeah. Um, so absolutely. Yeah. Katarina? Uh, were you participating in the same year? Yeah, you were. Yes. Yes, we were. Yeah. Both last year in the, in the second course. In the second course. What do you think was the best part of the program? Uh, I know this sounds very cute because I'm going to say exactly the same thing as <laughs> you, Juan. But uh, I also enjoyed the case studies because we were visiting organizations both in Finland and in Sweden. And for example, I remember visiting NESA and we had kind of this exercise where we were getting envelopes and then we were allowed to open the envelopes in a certain order and you were a little bit, what's coming next? <laughs> and then we were working both with Finns and Swedes on, on solving the, the problem. And it was really interesting. I really enjoyed it. And the other thing was, of course, the social network networking. And this was actually a wonderful experience because I remember coming here to Hannah Holm in early morning and you meet a lot of people that you don't know from before. And this group, we just clicked. And I remember Pat and Camilla saying that they were prepared to facilitate us and get us to know each other. But already on the first break, the noise was quite high because we were all <laughs> talking to each other. And we worked really well together on the cases, but we also had so many good laughs. Yeah. So yeah, I, I really loved the course. So basically, Pat could lay back and relax and just watch the show. Yeah, he was on vacation. No, yeah. just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's great to hear. It seems like the, the networking part and the social structure is one of the big advantages of participating in the program. Can you give any examples of uh, concrete projects maybe or concrete collaborations that has developed from the program? Do you want to go first or...? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, as Gunvor said, I think it was it, it was really fun with the mix of people. And then um, I remember at the end of the course, uh, I was sitting down together with Morgan Olofsson and with Per Lager. And we were saying, like, how can we bring sort of this spirit back home and do something uh, more? Where we sort of really wanted to take good examples, which is sort of action-oriented, uh, innovative, and also utilize sort of the experience that we've um, sort of gathered, particularly during the, the COVID pandemic. How can we bring this forward so we actually increase the speed of transformation within crisis preparedness? And then we came up with this idea to do a, a high-level seminar, which ended up uh, at SNS. Um, and I think the whole sort of essence of being able to do that was because we had such a broad group of actors being engaged. Mm -hmm. And that came really from, I would say, from the Hannah Holman sort of uh, mentality, talking and working cross-functionally. Uh, and I, in the end, I think it was super fun also that this also became not only uh, a really great seminar to push sort of uh, the topics forward, but also the, the initiation of, of this course, sort of the starting point for this course. So we sort of bound it together. So I think that's 
one concrete example of, of uh, what came out of the, the program. So maybe from now we will establish uh, something new here, the Hanna Holmen mentality for the defense family and the defense sector. What do you say, Katarina? Oh, yes, definitely. I actually have a list of things that have <laughs> happened since. Uh, so we have had ministerial level collaborations on many, many levels. We have had discussions around the Baltic connector, which, of course, is very relevant for the both of us. We have had Swedish alumni participating in a preparedness forum at the Finnish embassy in Stockholm. There have been meetings and exercises around defense and civil preparedness. There's been discussions on renewing the Finnish-Swedish bilateral security of supply agreement. And also I personally visited a preparedness seminar in Sweden actually together, together with you. And again, how do I know all this and well you have already mentioned the whatsapp group so we have a whatsapp group with with the alumni from from the second course and we exchange information and if there's something we need to know we can always ask in the whatsapp group so i was asking that hey can you tell us about the collaboration so because we are coming to this mm. this high level summit and we want to tell everybody what we have been doing and I mean, this WhatsApp group has been really, really good for keeping in contact. And we have actually faced some real situation, like there was this real disaster last spring. It was the Ice Hockey World Championships, where we did really, really poorly, both of us. And so we discussed this on the WhatsApp group and really kept the morale up between our two <laughs> nations. And this was where it was going so well until the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> <laughs> We're sorry about that. <laughs> no, but just in addition, I think sort of like this, during the pandemic, I mean, everything, it was very action oriented to, yeah. to be able to, you could be basically call and anybody because, I mean, everybody saw the need to support each other. Yes. Uh, but during sort of normal operations, lowering the barriers where you actually know each other, I think that's such a huge game changer to sort of build these networks because that's how you can really sort of uh, get things done. Mm. Uh, it's more on a structured way. You know who to call and you actually have a trust between the, 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 the people because we actually know each other. Mm. So I think that's also, um, I think, um, a great opportunity with the alumni to really uh, broaden the... the, the um, <laughs> The collaboration within that group as well mm. and something that could be expanded as well in the daily operations basically. Could the SNS seminar become a yearly uh, coming activity? Um, um, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very nice. <laughs> that would be very nice. Let's open up for uh, questions for uh, Johan and Katarina. So please feel free to raise your hand. And now I believe because I heard a great set of laughs here that you have more energy. So uh, please feel free to join the discussion. So if you could, if you could um, dream or wish, which is uh, some of my theme here today, I mean, collaboration and the essence of collaboration based on the Hanna Holman mentality is also for me something stated by the sky is not the limit. So if you could dream between you two uh, and wish for, uh, if we come back here next year, what would you, um, talk to me about regarding your cooperation? <laughs> well, I think that, and I've been talking a lot about this, but I'm a strong believer in exercises, and I think we could do a common exercise on civil preparedness. I know you have exercises in Sweden. We have in Finland, for example, the Tieto exercise. I don't see a reason why we couldn't do this together. So this is something that I really would like to see happening. Another thing is, and here I challenge the, the Hanna Holman initiative, we are now happy to welcome 20 more people into our alumni network. Use us alumni. I think we are 60 by the end of, of today. And as you can hear already how much we have been doing in the second course, think about having 60 people doing the same thing. So really challenge us and engage us and use us. I mean, we can be used on advisory boards. We are happy to come and join panels and we are happy to mentor in the fourth course and so on. So please utilize us. I, I think I continue on that note and maybe broaden it as well. I think also sending that action to our respective governments that maybe use this group <clears throat> where you get experience from both countries mm. when you have inquiries and so forth um, to really sort of get cross-functional from two countries experience and mm. from private public partnerships as well. Mm. Cross-functional, creative, innovative. 
So um, my to just just to summarize, I mean, you have stated the importance of that Hannah Holman mentality is the opposite of silo. It's the importance of the domino effect. I mean, the SNS seminar and the outcome of that. And you have uh, dreamed about the future. If we sit here together next year, can you give any concrete examples? You have, you have touched upon the exercise part, Katarina. Can you give any concrete examples uh, of what you have accomplished together? So I, I'm asking this question because I want to hold you on it from a year from now. <laughs> um, no, but, uh, again, uh, coming back to it, I think it would be super nice seeing something um, between the alumni that where we've actually been on an advisory board or something similar together uh, both Katarina and I, I have the opportunity to be on the advisory board for Hanna Holman, which is fantastic with the Hanna Holman initiative. But I mean, expanding that and using, utilizing that uh, sort of capability, as you say, it's 60 of us now that actually know each other. Mm. That's a great strength in itself. Mm. So. I, I think that's also the true essence of the Hanna Holman initiative. I mean, I mean, we have a lot of important decision makers here today, so we pass it on to them to, <laughs> to take it further. Please. Yeah, of course, another concrete example of what we could do, we could help Sweden also get the F-35s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but thank you for the advice. Uh, thank you. To summarize, Johan, uh, any wise words of the day, wise words today? Um, no, but I think it's been a fantastic start of the morning, uh, re really interesting um, uh, discussions. And, and I, I think, again, I mean, um, I'm um, a big fan of, of sort of bringing innovation and technology into mm. the mix. I think uh, the, the topics that Edwin brought up um, is super interesting. How do we make sure that we build resilience for the future together? And then I think it's so important that we utilize modern technologies. We really make sure that where will technology be in five or 10 years? And we really try to adapt our respective systems for that so we can sort of stay ahead of the technology development or at least stay in path with it. And be more flexible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and actually on a more serious note, I think that we should also stop to really appreciate and value what we are doing. Can you name any other two countries in the world that have such close ties and are such good friends with each other as Finland and Sweden. This is really valuable. So whatever we do, we should really appreciate this. So you mean that regardless of the F-35 and the Gripen uh, conversation, we can still be friends? Yeah, I mean, you can have the grip and we can win the ice hockey championship. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, my friends, on that note, please uh, join me in applauding our distinguished alumni once again. <laughs> so moving on, we are very delighted to have as our next session a keynote address from Jörg C, Deputy Assistant Secretary General at NATO, discussing the evolving security landscape. After uh, Mr. C's uh, keynote, the, uh, we will uh, have uh, insightful comments by Axel Hagelstam, Director of Research and Analysis of NESA. And Axel will share his reflection with us. Please join me in welcoming the Deputy Assistant Secretary General to the stage. A warm applaud, sir, the floor is yours. Get it up a bit here. So thank you very much and uh, good morning to everybody. And I should say at the beginning, one part of my portfolio is also defense planning. But I will absolutely withstand any comments about Gripen or something else. From a defense planning perspective, I would say as long as whatever type of aircraft it might be, it's combat ready and sustainable, we take it. Um, but this is something else. My, my second point I would like to, to start with is really saying that's a privilege and again a pleasure to be here. And I just found out actually yesterday evening, it's the third time now for me in totally different times. And I think this is something 
uh, really worth mentioning um, over three years and how the security landscape and especially also relationship between countries uh, has again changed and evolved. And my third point is uh, just listening to, to industry, again, makes me very humble in terms of what industry can really deliver if, the, let's say, the industry gets what they need in terms of a clear signal, a clear responsibility, points of contact. Um, and I'm also triggered, actually, to stray away a bit from my, my current topic today, talking about defense industrial base, talking about demand signals, uh, talking about um, getting the right demand signal at the right time. Uh, clear communications between industry and others. I shouldn't do that because I think I will disrupt the agenda of today. But it's really one of the key topics in, in, our, in my responsibility back in Brussels to think about that as well uh, when it comes to industry and how we uh, actually foster our relationship with industry. Uh, back a bit to resilience. Um, and as I'm from NATO, you may not be surprised to hear that clearly our view looking into resilience is a bit different different in terms of uh, that our lens looking through it is clearly deterrence and defense. And we consider actually resilience, and this is not a question whether it's civil or military, as the backbone uh, looking into successful deterrence uh, and uh, ability to deter and to defend. In the same way as our civilian populations depend on the provision of essential services, we just heard about that, such as electricity, communications, and health, just to give you examples, our military forces rely on these uh, very same civilian and commercial infrastructure and services to deter and defend in times of crisis. So just imagine armed forces and army uh, trying to deploy without accessible ports, aircrafts, railways, highways, or whatsoever, dysfunctional, it simply won't work. So this is why it's so ex essential. This is, and I think this is one of the crucial lessons of the last years. Actually, we could have started a bit earlier, either 2008 or 2014. We started already, but I think the brutal Russian war against uh, Ukraine just made it again very obvious uh, what resilience really means. And uh, just um, uh, chapeau to, to the Ukrainian population, how they deal with it. We had the pleasure uh, very often in our headquarters to listen to Ukrainians, uh, to, to, uh, to CEOs, how they make their own, uh, let's say, supply chain more resilient, how this works, uh, just, just, just amazing and impressive. But the key point is today, what, what's, what's NATO's uh, stake? What's NATO's role in that? Examples, I think, like the sabotage on the Nord Stream pipeline last year or the recently uh, lead, de detected uh, rupture of the Baltic connector just mentioned this morning, the gas pipeline, have shown that our infrastructure is absolutely vulnerable and it can provide easy targets for our competitors who seek opportunities to exploit and openly display such potential vulnerabilities. This is why a simple reason actually, but it's uh, much more complex at NATO, that we consider resilient and functional infrastructure as a critical component of national collective defense and resilience. It's just, uh, let's say, two different parts of the same coin. In turn, we need to say this is not new. This is all firmly rooted in Article 3 of the NATO Treaty. Uh, so if you just read it again, it's just obvious. However, I think over 30 years of crisis management, a bit, let's say, focusing on different issues, it's not we have forgotten it, uh, but uh, clearly I think the focus was somewhere else, and I think this is one of the key observations. Resilience ensures that the three core functions of civil preparedness, and I'm just relating to the diamond uh, model a bit, uh, which is in my case a bit easier, the continuity of government, the delivery of essential services to our populations and civil support to the armed forces, uh, let's say the, the more simplistic way of looking into it. These core functions um, identified already what you have heard, I think, by colleagues before during the courses, uh, which I really appreciate having that kind of uh, joint courses to look into that, uh, what we call the seven baseline requirements, looking exactly into that where we started uh, following the summit in 2016 in Warsaw, just to take that um, as a measurement against each and every nation can look, let's say, about itself and how good it is or maybe how, um, how bad at this stage and how much more cooperation uh, might be necessary in there. Notably, notably, and I think this is interesting as my topic today is critical infrastructure, four of these seven baseline requirements require functional infra and critical infrastructure, namely in the area of energy supply, communications, food and water, as well as transport systems. Uh, in simple terms, without assured access to these infrastructure and services, our militaries are unable to fulfill the tasks our allies you give to them. So ensuring and protecting access to these facilities, ports, roads, just repeating again, railways, cables, pipelines is challenging, to say the least. Much of our critical infrastructure is inherently vulnerable, I said that, and distance is one of the big pieces and accessibility. We are talking about thousands, if not 10,000 of kilometers of either cables 
uh, usually owned by, by, the pub, by the private sector, commercial sector, just not an easy endeavor to look into that. Um, and there are a lot of cascading effects, I think, uh, with regards to what does it mean for the military. So what do I mean with that? Um, just, and you mentioned this morning, hybrid cyber. I'm also a bit, this is my only point on WhatsApp. I really like it. But when it comes to cyber and vulnerability, something we need to, to look out sometimes. Um, just to give you four, let's say three examples. Citizens, you, me, may no longer be able to call emergency services if communications doesn't work. Train drivers may no longer be able to contact the stations are they supposed to reach. They simply cannot do that anymore. And even data processing modules and servers of energy operators might be affected, preventing them from delivering electricity. So I could simply continue with that list, but it's so obvious and we just need to, to watch out. And an extra layer, and I just we heard it this morning, I wouldn't call it complication, maybe it's, maybe it's a bit more complexity is that is all market driven, listening to again to the industry. It's not owned by the state. I'm not saying it would be even easier or better just owned by the state. That's not the answer. I think the answer is proper communications exchange and to make the corporation uh, right. And this is where this initiative really, really kicks in uh, to make that happen and to provide that platform. Just to give you a couple of numbers where we think uh, we are NATO when it comes to uh, relying on, on civil support, um, roughly, or just roughly, 90% of military transport across allied territory travels through commercial means. 70% uh, of military satellite communications are provided by commercial means. 85%, roughly again, of military requirements for food and water resources some, uh, come from the commercial sector. I think this just underpins how, how, how big and how broad are the interconnecting pieces are here. You could again argue that's not new if you go back a bit to the early 90s. And I recall a book from, uh, from an American three-star called Moving Mountains, talking about to get the equipment uh, into Iraq in the early 90s. This was all about commercial shipment, all about commercial aircrafts. Nobody, not even our American friends, have enough, let's say, green aircrafts or green ships uh, to make that happen. Um, what is NATO's role then in there? I said the why. What can we do? First, I think one of NATO's core tasks is to deter and defend against aggression against allied territory, again, our core mission. This includes aggression against civilian infrastructure is a key part of it. And we saw a visible demonstration of this role when NATO increased its maritime presence around the North Sea energy infrastructure in response to the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines. And we have done it again following the Baltic Connector incident. So there's a lot of um, action in terms of surveillance, rec reconnaissance, just getting a better picture and then having an exchange platform. I'll come back to that uh, in a second uh, to talk about that. So one result was at the Vilnius summit that heads of state of government, so really the highest level, announced the establishment of a maritime center for the security of critical undersea infrastructure, water term, uh, to increase situation awareness and to enhance maritime presence for deterrence and defense. So this is exactly the forum I'm talking about, where actually the public, the private sector, the militaries uh, under the head of MACOM uh, in Northwood can talk to each other, exchange the, the picture, the intelligence picture, and have a better view on what is really ongoing. Second, NATO, I think, uh, has a strong role in defining military requirements that can also apply to civilian infrastructure. And this brings me a bit back to the demand signal. For example, uh, by identifying which airports are essential for deployment or which brigades need to be able to support heavy equipment, NATO's defense plans can help nations determine which infrastructure is critical and based on that develop measures to monitor or protect it accordingly. Why I'm saying that is again the sheer number of infrastructure and even critical infrastructure. And it really starts when you talk about and when you talk with 31 allies or 32, hopefully actually tomorrow. Um, or even sooner, um, actually should have happened yesterday. Anyway, it's, it's about um, the number, the sheer number of critical infrastructure we need to think about. And not every can be critical and totally protected. So we need to identify, we need to prioritize. And then this in itself, I think, is an issue. The, pl the plans for that can help. And third, maybe UNATO, I would call it a unique forum for allies to share information and intelligence, discuss the threat environment we are facing, exchange best practices and lessons learned. For that purpose, we have what we call the Resilience Committee, which is a unique platform now in NATO to talk about that. And again, I come back to that a bit uh, later. Earlier this year, we prepared a report on national best practices of the resilience of undersea infrastructure. The report was based on input voluntarily provided by allies. This underlined the immense added value of an active exchange among allies. I'm just, 
underpinning again voluntarily, uh, because Article 3 makes it very clear there's a national responsibility, but I think an absolute um, commitment on the collective side, because it matters what's been done by one ally, immediately matters what does it mean for others. Um, listening again this morning to you, to industry and, and to others, I think uh, we, we just need to recognize that, that you, the Baltic nations, the Scandinavian nations, the, the North, the Nordic nations, whatever you call, however you call the club, just have lots and lots to offer in terms of experience. Um, many have, but I think you have been just um, um, quite, quite significant and uh, successful already, uh, not getting into Finland and Sweden in terms of who catches up with whom. Again, uh, from a NATO perspective, we just take it and we would just encourage you to take that and take on this kind of leading role, talk to others, share practices with them, just make them very clear uh, what this could mean. And exercises is another super example. I'm just glad to hear that uh, because... Uh, whatever we can do apart from having courses, exercising with each other, not only on a national basis, but also in a binational or multinational basis when it comes to that, is the best way of actually doing it. Um, I just mentioned the Resilience Committee, so I'm not, it's not about talking committee business here, but as we speak, actually as I speak now, um, we have the, um, the senior resilience coordinators and officials back in Brussels. So 31 allies around the table. And uh, one of the reasons to get into this kind of committee structure was not just about we need another one, but um, in, simple, in simple terms, uh, when we started talking and thinking about defense, this has been always very clear. We just um, gather the defense ministers and here you go. And if you want to talk about foreign policy, you just invited, so the section in this case invited the foreign ministers, here you go. Talking about resilience and the inherent complexity of that, this was a bit of a game changer because if I call the defense minister, not me, but the Sekjen, in terms of resilience related questions, he would say, oh, well, maybe in my country this is part of the Minister of Interior or maybe the transport minister or whatever else. I'm a German by background, 16 federal states, a nightmare in this case. Um, however, we started again, let's say, uh, moving into this direction to make this as a coordination piece. And I think we wanted to have senior representatives once or twice a year with at least a coordinating authority back in their countries to talk about the transport ministry, the Minister of Interior, the health ministry, to talk about that. And this needs to be facilitated. So this happens actually now, talking about lessons from Ukraine, talking about uh, what we can do better in response to Russia's aggression uh, and so forth. So exchanges on how to strengthen resilience across the European continent and beyond, uh, however, not just limited to NATO and its allies. Uh, they also include the European Union, and we just heard it this morning, given its resources, and there's a lot of regulatory power within the European Union, which NATO does not have, uh, which makes them really a strategic partner on that. And without the EU, uh, many things in the um, resilience and enablement world, I should say, simply would not work. And that's just a given. So the NATO-EU cooperation, um, just going back to January this year, Secretary General Stoltenberg, um, the, the President of the Commission von der Leyen, they agreed to have a task force on resilience, um, looking into critical infrastructure, energy, transport, digital infrastructure and space, uh, a bit as a model project. It had started working, uh, it produced the first report, that's always a good starting point, uh, just ahead of the Vilnius Summit. Uh, it's fully integrated into the structured dialogue with the EU um, from the NATO side um, in the structured dialogue on resilience. The report came up with 14 recommendations, a fairly long list on the last page, by the way, publicly uh, and widely um, published, so you can read it. Um, I think and this has made it very clear that a lot of resilience work is simply related to each other in both organizations to different, with a different lens in many, in many respects. So just to give you one example, again, straying away a bit, but it might be interesting. Um, when you talk about foreign direct investment, so actually what foreign countries invest in another one, so all the people now from the private sector are much more educated on that than me. But the point is, Either you look into that just from an economic perspective and just take it, okay, we just take it and there are now different shares and so forth. Um, and for many in the EU, for good reasons, I think this is the key perspective as economy plays a major role in there. In NATO, we look into foreign direct investment through a totally different lens because does it lead to, uh, let's say, limitations and access in being an open uh, for our national forces, for NATO forces? Uh, let's say, elements of a, of a port, not only Hamburg, there are others, uh, but th this is one of the key questions when we look into foreign direct investment. There's a deterrence and defense perspective on that. 
which is not easy to, to, to grapple because we don't have the means. Another area where we have to think about cooperation with the EU, and I think it works. So it's all about complementary and complementary uh, work on that. Um, concluding a bit, uh, because as I don't want to um, get over too much over my time, I think in the strategic concept uh, last year in uh, 2022, which we came up with um, in Madrid, there's one recognition apart from the Euro Atlantic area is not at peace anymore. You could even argue and say maybe at war, maybe for some it goes too far. This is always a compromise in the end. But there's also the terminology talking about strategic competition. And I think this is reality we just need to face in a different way, both on the civil and the military side, both on the public and on the private sector side. Strategic competition is simply the world within which we are living. Uh, we had a tendency for many decades to talk about globalization, I think maybe only in its more positive elements, but there are some elements, what I would call the flip side of it, we just need to be cognizant about that and just find the right uh, way uh, to deal with it. And I think, um, as I said, initiatives like that are bringing us together at, in, in a forum, uh, people like me looking a bit sometimes as a, being called maybe a dinosaur or NATO, just looking through deterrence and defense and why does it matter, I think the better we can cooperate with you, the public sector in your countries, the private sector, uh, with, the, um, with the industries, what I heard again, very inspiring this morning, even though I'm not an engineer by trade, so a couple of things you uh, may have lost me already, but it's just amazing for me how industry can help to make this happen. And this brings me back uh, what I didn't want to do, talking about uh, defense industry and uh, the, the cooperation with it. What we need to rethink is how to set up a cooperation, a basis, that makes us again ready in the long haul for a prolonged war, at least a prolonged crisis in a strategic competition. This is sometimes painful, this is maybe not even nice, but I think it's a necessity to think about that. And this brings us back to preparation. The better you are prepared in peacetime, the better you are prepared for anything else coming across. And I think this is one of the key messages in these really, really not uh, very easy times. I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Please join me for one or two questions and we, uh, I will open up once again for questions from the audience. And now I really think that uh, after this keynote, I think we have a lot of interesting questions. Sir, you, you mentioned the importance of prioritizing, but um, my question is, is it even possible for NATO to effectively, effectively manage the security risk tied to reliance on civilian and commercial infrastructure for military operation in the world we are living in? No, no the test is, the AC test is to operate it. <laughs> <laughs> is there something I can disrupt? I think so. Here yeah. we go, it's on now, so I just uh, muted it. Um, the answer, I think, is, is a clear yes. But I think we just need to understand what really NATO can do. It's, it's not... Um, don't get me wrong, it's, it's not ruling things, it's not just um, doing things in a different way uh, with others for others. It's setting the framework, it's providing a forum, it's providing, let's say, a clear demand signal when it comes to what we need. It's providing clarity on what we think what is required when it comes to our plans. So this is all setting the framework for you, other public services, for you, other militaries, for you, private sector, uh, to set up a framework within which you can operate. Mm. And I think this is a huge difference. So NATO cannot and should not take over that, but within, with that kind of framework and setting it and, and having the right dis discussions, bringing the right people together around the table, I think that's key su to success. And in the Resilience Committee, for example, um, as I said, we had briefings from, from Ukrainians, uh, we had um, briefings uh, from companies like Maersk uh, in container shipping and so forth when it comes to transport and logistics. So I think we can play a role in this civil military cooperation when it comes to forum and setting framework. Uh, when it comes to the military as such, clearly this is uh, the, the, the primary role. Uh, the, the mechanics are a bit different, but I think setting the forum, uh, setting the framework, I think this is where, where NATO can play really, really a significant role together with the EU as I think... Uh, well, 25, I think we are now in terms of membership. It's pretty much the same club. This is, by the way, looking on the map, having now Finland and then Sweden in NATO. I think the convergence of NATO EU simply grows. Uh, that's, that's just a matter of fact and hopefully makes our life in both organizations sometimes a bit easier. 
hopefully. Do you believe that in the end, in the, I mean, the essence, the whole essence here today at Hanna Holm and the Hanna Holm Initiative is cooperation. And you had touched a lot about uh, the importance of the uh, cooperation between the allies in the NATO context. Do you believe in the sense of strategic uh, competition that you mentioned that we can do more in the cooperation part from the NATO platform? Yeah, I think you, you can always do more. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's, it's a given, everybody knows that. Um, NATO is a consensus-based uh, organization. And of course, uh, we often have, 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 have critical debates and also on the resilience side, uh, we have nations who are super good nationally on, on resilience, but uh, sometimes maybe a bit on, wow, why is NATO doing that and it shouldn't be the EU and whose role is it? But I think this is a discussion we, we can cover. And uh, clearly when we talk about um, resilience and what could we could be doing uh, in all the nations, this is in the end also again about investment. Mm. Uh, this does not come for free. And I should have said when I talk about demand, demand signal, one is the clear demand signal, I'm, I'm fully with you. But I would add uh, it needs to be a sustainable demand signal because what we do, especially when it comes to military capabilities and for industry, this is not just for the next four or five years. Uh, this is about for the next decade and beyond uh, because industry would not change approach with having no clarity and sustainable signals uh, by, by the publics, by the governments in terms of defense spending. Um, and this is why I think one of the key lessons, uh, maybe on the key themes we have learned over the last years, that many years everything was a bit separated in terms of understanding there's a defense spending debate and then there's a contributing debate and then there's a bit of a capability debate and i think we just need to re-understand this is all interconnected without the cash without the defense spending you won't get the capabilities without the capabilities which is more than platforms you cannot commit or contribute um, so it doesn't make sense to isolate and to have isolated discussions this is all interconnected and i think Yes, we could do more. I think we have come a long way in a good way, but there's always, always room for improvement and having allies taking on board who can just um, provide uh, much more and uh, value con having value valuable contributions. Hopefully. Sir, if we could su summarize and end up on, if we, um, I mean, as we said, the whole essence of the Hannah Holman is uh, collaboration and cooperation and uh, great hopes for the future. If we invite you in one year from now, what do you wish that you could talk about then? Well, actually, I wouldn't wait for one year uh, to have Sweden as a member, as I said um, <laughs> rather yesterday, um, ideally tomorrow, but Thank it's, you. It's, it's not in my hands. Uh, so this is not a wish, this is rather, in my terms, an expectation, to be very honest with you. Mm. Uh, and secondly, I just want to see, not only in one year, I think a growing understanding of that our security environment has significantly changed. Uh, it's not nice to recognize that, it's sometimes painful, as I said, but it's vital. And I think this is where, where I would wish for that the, the collaborative, the common understanding of all of us, be it military, be it civil, be it public, be it private, be it economy, regardless, uh, just grows and just recognizes that our security environment has uh, changed. I could say, you know, um, I, I would clearly wish for a different security environment. Of course. But I think um, uh, this is a common element. We just need to be realistic. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the world within which we are living and we need to find the right ways uh, to deal with it. Mm. That's great. Uh, please join me in thanking the Deputy Assistant Secretary General for sharing his insights with us. <laughs> now, my friends, it's time to give a warm welcome to Axel Hagelstam, Director of Research and Analysis National Emergency. We give uh, Axel a warm applause. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank, Herr Sey. Thank you for your, your very insightful um, uh, keynote speech. Um, it's great to be here, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's always a peculiar position for a Finn to um, be looked at, for example, and, and uh, um, that, that uh, it's usually the other way around. We look to the West, to Sweden, to see uh, and to take learning and examples, and now it's the other way around. But I would explain it this way, that <clears throat> Finland was so slow to adapt to the post-Cold War uh, situation, so we actually missed an entire era, <laughs> and now we're back ahead. Um, 
Um, be that as it may, um, our our uh, arrangements serve us quite well in this in, in this changed security environment, and that's of course not always only a, a positive thing. Um, as a response to to the deputy secretary general's um, speech about NATO and and NATO's work on resilience, I would like to start out by saying that um, back in 2014, um, when uh, when Russia invaded Crimea. NATO was the one to, to sound the alarm bell. NATO was the, the organization where the, the, uh, the awareness of the severity of the situation and the severities of our vulnerabilities in the non-military sphere really uh, was, was brought to the forefront. And, and I think that NATO's work developing the baseline requirements and the resilience guidelines, which helps member states and at the time also partners to, uh, to go through their own non-military um, preparedness systems was an extremely important part of, of bringing us to where we are now collectively, um, where we all agree on the fact that you cannot do military defense with only military planning and military resources. You need the non-military part as well. Um, and we see that now um, with what the European Union is doing, developing directives and other initiatives, some of them legislative, some of them of other types, um, which really speaks the same language. Identify your critical sectors, identify your key vulnerabilities, and find solutions in strengthening them. And I think this is, um, at least in part, but to a great part, uh, thanks to the work that was done at NATO in 2014-15 in and, and so on. But nevertheless, the security environment has changed severely, and um, that really has brought us to a place where we need to look at our preparedness levels. In Finland, we have maintained civil preparedness and resilience, security of supply arrangements, but have we kept them at the sufficient level? Do we have a sufficient level of preparedness for a potential period of isolation or uh, di severe disturbances in key value chains and, and delivery chains. Um, and I think that that's one important element that we need to look at. Do we have enough preparedness, both material preparedness, but also in, in the resilience of the critical infrastructure? Do we know which critical infrastructures are the ones that we will need in, in a crisis situation? What we're working with, with Yarna, the, the National Emergency Supply Agency, is now going through what installations, what infrastructures, and what systems are the most important ones to establish a list so that we know where to start and we know where, uh, what we need, really need to secure in cooperation with the private sector, of course, the owners and operators of these critical systems. Um, we also need a closer synchronization of the military and the non-military planning processes. And I think that um, we, we know how to do it, but we haven't brought them close enough so that in a, a crisis situation or an escalating um, crisis situation, we can link those two planning processes together at an early enough stage. We need to, we need to bring them closer already uh, before the crisis hits. Um, we need a better and more common situational awareness. We need to understand the effects of crisis on our economies and through the economies on the maintenance of the critical functions of society. Um, and this, can be, this situational awareness can only be done in cooperation with the businesses, the private sector that knows their value chains, that knows their, their production systems and can predict what events will lead to which deficiencies and disturbances in, in these economic functions that we rely on. Um, we need to understand the vulnerabilities, also the vulnerabilities that extend beyond our borders, the global value chains that we rely on um, in, in our everyday uh, activities and lives. We, um, we are vulnerable to very concentrated, very specific delivery chains of both services and, and materials. And we need to understand them and we need to be able to build um, systems where we can mitigate the effects of, of vulnerabilities like these. This requires also a better understanding of the requirements that we place on the private sector with regards to maintaining critical functions during crisis. The companies need to understand what is expected of them 
in a crisis and how the cooperation in maintaining this, um, these f uh, functions uh, can be done in a more efficient way between the public and the private um, actors. I would say for NATO um, that what would be incredibly valuable would be looking at how we can support each other in guaranteeing or, or securing access to critical goods and materials in a crisis situation, and, and perhaps for NATO, more specifically in the in the defense sector. But as we know, the defense sector is is a wide complex. So um, access to critical materials, critical components, and goods could be um, secured in a more communal way in NATO, a, a common priority and allocation system, if you will, um, that would serve uh, the allies in, um, in, in crisis well. Another thing that I know our senior national official will be saying, or perhaps is saying right now um, at headquarters in NATO, is that the baseline requirements that were developed, uh, which gave a very good structure and a very good starting point um, for for um, strengthening resilience throughout the alliance. Perhaps we could look at the baselines and, and ask, do they cover everything that we need, to, we need to look at? Would it be possible or would it be necessary to perhaps look at also the wider industrial base? Uh, NATO used to have an industrial planning group um, uh, back, in, back in the 90s and early 20s, um, which looked at industrial production not only military production, but also other, other types of production, maintained lists of critical companies and, and production capacities. And, and I think that that perhaps could be something that we could look at a little closer again. Also, financial and payment systems are critical to our societies and uh, could perhaps also be looked at through, through the lens of the baseline requirements. To conclude, I'd like to say that from our, or in Finland, the way that we view resilience is that resilience really, in essence, is an economic activity. It is, it is the private sector and the economy that generates the critical services and production that we rely on. And therefore, strengthening resilience has to be done respecting the dynamics and the logic of the economic functions that we work with. And hence, like the Deputy Secretary General mentioned, um, foreign direct investments, they, have, they are an economic function or an economic event that have security implications. Resilience and security of supply are economic activities that, um, that have a security uh, implication. So resilience really is the crossroads between economy and security, and this is the, uh, the approach that we take in Finland. So um, with these words, um, I'd like to say thank you very much to the organizers and uh, I hope and I wish you all a continued good day. Thank you. Thank you so, uh, so much, uh, Axel, for the important uh, comments and your insightful ref reflections. You mentioned the, the importance of closer synchronization between civil and military planning, and also mentioned how complex it is. Do you have any concrete ideas of who, how we can move forward in that perspective? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a very good question. And it is, it is indeed a complex um, question because the, the planning processes are quite different mm. in nature. But I think, um, and I think they should be different um, because they, um, they deal with quite different and um, quite different situations, really, yes. quite different realities that they plan for. But nevertheless, those realities at some point in an escalating crisis will meet. Of course. And it's that, that place where those two realities really meet, where we need to already understand how to manage those, um, that transition from a normal circumstance towards um, a not normal um, or, um, yeah. Mm. circumstance where, where the other, other dynamics apply. And, and this understanding needs to be stretched be, um, across um, from the military side to the civil side and, and vice versa. Mm.
I asked uh, Jarna before how she her view about regarding her view about the Swedish and Finnish cooperation. Can you mention something uh, from your perspective as the director for research and analyze how Sweden and Finland can mm, fast forward with the cooperation? Well, there's there's so much we can do together, really, um, and and there's so much we're already doing and, and particularly thinking about doing, and um, I mean. How shall I say it? Like I said, Finland was slow to adapt. Mm. Um, Sweden had significant and um, large arrangements and structures in place uh, with regards to security of supply and resilience, uh, which we engaged with uh, at that time. And now I think it's we're very close to the to the situation where Sweden again will have arranged itself around the question of of civil preparedness, security of supply and resilience. Um, which, which will allow us again to, to engage and, and interlink on an organizational level. And I, I do agree with, with Jarna and, and other colleagues here saying that, that Sweden, Sweden will develop quite fast. Mm. Um, and, and I think that we have a lot to learn where Sweden is building its resilience systems from, from more or less an empty table and thinking about problems in a new way, whereas we have updated our our you know, legacy systems, and and we can. Pr I'm sure we will. We will have a lot to learn from from Sweden when when Sweden develops. And I might add that really, um, I'd say the strategic depth of Finnish resilience mm. really lies in the Swedish industrial base and the Swedish uh, capabilities. And and I think if we are able to interlink and cooperate on a deeper level, it will strengthen Finnish, Finnish resilience significantly. And that, that really puts the framework for the importance of the friendship between Sweden and Finland and what we can accomplish together. Thank you so much, Axel. So now it's time uh, to uh, listen to uh, interesting case examples. So please join me in welcoming Håkan G, the managing director of Scania Ukraine, to the stage. Please join me in welcoming Tina Turnala, CEO of the Finnish Ship Owners Asso Association. And last but not least, Petri Pukainen, uh, that will present the Nordic Pine exercise. A warm applause. So, uh, Håkan, um, yes, I will wait so you can take your seats. <laughs> no stress. Uh, Håkan, please, uh, the word and the floor is yours. Thank you, Minu. I don't know if Scania needs an introduction. It, it's a great Swedish company. I've been working there 26 years myself. We make... Um, heavy trucks and buses in, in Ukraine were mainly into trucks. And I spent the last six years uh, in Kiev. And uh, I believe, and I always tell my colleagues that right now we have the most important working tasks that we will ever have. We started in Ukraine 30 years ago, we were never active uh, during the Soviet Union because then we were in a group with Saab. Uh, defense equipment, we wouldn't work in the Soviet Union. Um, but 1993, we established ourselves in Kiev. At the same time, we established ourselves in Russia. Uh, the Russian business is gone, closed. Uh, but we are celebrating our 30th anniversary. And one of the first tasks was to build up a dealer network, workshop network around Ukraine. Um, Mid-90s. We had several candidates. We particularly had a young, dynamic guy from Donetsk who wanted to establish a Skarna dealership. We make tough controls of the people we work with. <laughs> and, uh, and this guy had been convicted of robbery, and there were uh, rumors about rape cases. So he didn't become a Skarna dealer. It didn't stop the Ukrainians from electing him prime minister and later on president. <laughs> Maybe things would have developed differently if he'd been selling Scarlet trucks instead. <laughs> but then we built up a deal network. Uh, we had 12 points. One was bombed, so 11 right now. Major cities, major transport hubs all around the country. Uh, we were planning to open one in Mariupol 2022. And we had one in Donetsk, which we lost in 2014. So 
So when we saw the troops uh, gathering last year, we, we started to prepare. I mean, it's very difficult to prepare for something like this, but uh, one of the important decisions we made was to move the data service from our main site in, in the Bucha district outside Kiev to Lviv. And this really saved us because we had the data left and we could continue to work. And we also moved out parts and, and uh, workshop equipment from uh, the places where we thought something might happen, mainly in the eastern part of the country. Then it came, this is from the 28th of February, we still had electricity at our main site so we could follow on the surveillance cameras when the missiles started to come down. The picture to the left is our sister company, MAN. They had their office, uh, well, 20 kilometers from us, completely gone, beginning of March. Picture to the right, it's our closest neighbor, logistics center, also blown out. Uh, people started to move massively towards the west. Roads were blocked, there were Russian troops. Bridges were destroyed. Um, we turned our Lviv dealership into a hub for uh, evacuation. We evacuated some 124 family members out of Ukraine. They were uh, met by, um, by the border by uh, Scania families in Central Europe, mainly Czechia, Slovakia, Poland, and, and, and stayed there. Most of them are back in Ukraine. Basically, everyone are back in Ukraine. At the same time, we set up a hub for uh, humanitarian aid coming into the country. And with the help of our customers, we could distribute that into Ukraine. But we lost control of, of this uh, site close to Bucha. Uh, we got drone photo, uh, photos from the Ukrainian military so we could follow a bit what happened. Russian troops came in, took over the office. And then it turned into no man's land. Um, everything around was basically bombed, destroyed. And on April 6th, we could come back, then the Russian troops had basically been hunted out of the Kiev area. There was not that much damage to the building itself. And the secret behind that was probably the 50 liters of alcohol that was stored in the human resources department left over from the Christmas party. <laughs> that is hybrid warfare. <laughs> so here's a life hack. Don't lock the bar at home. In case you get Russians into the house, they will not get much further. So with some minor repairs, we could continue the work. And one of the issues was that we had a big stock of trucks, 50 trucks parked in Kiev, and Kiev area was not really safe. Um, Ukrainian government immediately issued an order that everyone with a B license, passenger car license, could drive trucks. So here's the IT department engaged in moving our stock of trucks to Lviv. And there we could continue deliveries. We set up a temporary office in Lviv. I went myself to Riga for a couple of months, then I went back to Ukraine. Uh, here we're delivering 60 units to uh, Fossi, one of the main food retail chains, who got part of, their, part of their truck park destroyed. Really important that we could do this. Then, already in June, we inaugurated a second workshop in Kiev. We had a project to do this. And, uh, many people thought that it would be insane to make an investment in Ukraine, in Kiev, in June 2022. But we went on with this. This is me and the ambassador, Tobias Tyberg, opening it. Small ice workshop on the other side of the river Dnipro. Uh, really needed because it was restricted traffic over the river. There was a deficit of fuel. And, and this workshop became profitable immediately. Probably our best investment ever. But above all, a really clear statement that we're here to stay, and we will support Ukraine. I mean, some other workshops suffered more. This is a private workshop in Kharkiv, northeastern part, private partner since 1996, and this is a long time for a partnership in Ukraine, business life. Uh, Nikolai Sakalov, uh, the owner, 70 years old, this is his life, he lives at the site, he had to abandon it, but after the Russian forces were driven out of uh, Kharkiv in September, he could come back. He put all the expensive workshop equipment and spare parts behind bricks into a wall. So lots of damages, but the workshop is up and running again. And it's a new reality, of course. We have these constant air alarms, even if it's been quite calm the last weeks. We have routines for that. We go down to the basement, 
We have a shelter, we have Wi-Fi, we have bathrooms, food, water. Double electricity lines. When I come to the head office in Sweden, there's usually no one there. They claim that they're doing some hybrid work. No one is in the office. We don't have this kind of discussions. We always have electricity in the office. People don't have electricity at home. Everybody comes to office. <laughs> Safety first, of course. We're building shelters out by the workshops, by the service stations. Here we're inaugurating the Kiev shelter when the Swedish Prime Minister was visiting us earlier this year. Business-wise, this is the best year we ever had during the 30 years we've been in Ukraine. And what is it we're selling them? Well, very much is driven by the need for um, transportation of grain, since the Black Sea has been closed and container transportation has been closed. These are road tippers that Ukrainians are rebuilding. There's no road construction going on. Instead, they weld high sides to the tippers and transport grain. A wooden version. But of course, this leads to a lot of good normal business as well. We have delivered some 400 grain combinations, which of course is an important contribution to Ukraine's ability to export grain. And Russia also bombed fuel infrastructure early on during the war. We have delivered more than 100 fuel trucks to the biggest fuel retailer. A year ago there was a fuel deficit, you couldn't get fuel in many parts of Ukraine. Today that's not an issue, you get fuel everywhere. Windows. When you have this blast, the windows go out. So big deficit of windows. We're actually planning to rent an office in this building by the train station. We didn't, thanks God. But those who are into glass works are really making good business. So we delivered lots of glass carriers as well. As for reconstruction itself, it hasn't really begun. We have delivered some concrete mixes. This is for building bridges in Chernigov. But of course, long term, when this is over, this will be the biggest construction site in the world with tremendous business opportunities. And just one more example. Firefighters. Normally, a firefighter doesn't drive a lot, and you can keep them for long. Now all the firefighters in Ukraine have been working 24-7 for soon two years. So we're actually building the first firefighters now in Ukraine together with local partner. We provide the chassis and they build the firefighting equipment. So in conclusion, what I think we should do as businesses is to try to sustain normality as much as possible. 85% of Ukraine's territory is not occupied and life needs to go on there. So business as usual is priority number one. To make sure that our employees have a work to go to and to make sure that our customers' employees also have a work to go to and receive a salary. And at the same time, we support critical infrastructure. We make sure that critical goods reach where they are supposed to go. And by that, we contribute to the resilience of Ukraine. Thank you. Tina, please uh, take the stage, and uh, while you do that, I will uh, ask you one question, Joakim. Um, I mean, besides the obvious complexity in operating during full-scale war, what would you say is your biggest finding? You mentioned business as usual, but mainly from, more from a securing critical infrastructure perspective. Yeah, I think we have all been very impressed by the strong civil society in Ukraine how everybody comes together to, to, to help Ukraine to do the best out of this situation, including the business sector. And I think one of the reasons behind this is the structure of Ukrainian business. Ukrainian business is essentially Ukrainian in terms of ownership and control. The, the main, and, and Russian interests have been systematically driven out since 2014. So that the main companies are controlled by Ukrainian owners, owners that can make decisions quickly themselves. They don't have to consult any corporate policies or call the head office abroad or deal with the compliance department. They make what they deem necessary. And I think in our Swedish or possibly Finnish contexts, things might look a bit different. Mm. 
That's an important insight. Thank you. I mean, ju just one thing. We've been working a lot to secure fuel transportation, and that's really critical, both civilian and, and the, the fuel transportation to the front. That's a nightmare. 80% of Sweden's oil refining capacity is controlled by a Saudi Arabian company. Mm. I don't know if that means anything, but... Mm. But it's an, it's an important insight, and uh, thank you. Tina, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, and good, uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you for the invitation, it's an honor. It's an honor to be able to join you. I will talk about uh, securing maritime transport. And I think this is a good picture describing that world trade goes by sea. 90% of the world trade is carried by shipping. There are about 50,000 merchant vessels in the world. And it has been said that if shipping stopped, half of the world's people would freeze and another half of the people would starve. And that's probably quite true. But for the Finland, it's e sea is even more, ex more important. 96% of, of exports and imports are transported by sea. We often say that Finland is, is like an island. There is no alternative to sea transportation. And war in Ukraine has further emphasized the importance of the sea transport. Up to 97.7% of Finnish imports is transported by sea. 1,300 kilometers of Russian border were basically, is practically closed after the war as well as the Saima Channel. The northern conditions bring additional challenges to functionality of maritime logistics in, in Finland and in, in Baltic Sea. <coughs> Gulf of Finland is ice covered approximately 100 days every year. And it also, at also the shallow and busy, busy waters with a lot of crossing traffic including oil tankers from Russia. The Gulf of Finland is one of the most difficult areas to navigate in the world. And in, ad in addition, Baltic Sea is a particularly sensitive sea area. And then a few words about the, uh, how the war in Ukraine has affected on maritime transport. A few examples. As we all know, the situation in, in the Black Sea is difficult. Unfortunately, Russia also cancelled the Crane Agreement in July. The war also affected maritime traffic in the Baltic Sea. One very worrying effect is the shadow fleet or dark fleet in Russian oil transportation. Shadow fleet consists of two to 300 ships or even more to avoid Western oil sanctions. Some of the oil tankers are old and out of shape. Tankers should be also ice classified in these areas, but, uh, but unfortunately, there are many vessels not having to ice classing. And also ice and shallow water needs navigation skills. But I'm afraid that those skills are missing from many of the seafarers. In, ad in addition to this unfortunate phenomenon, also the risk of hybrid, hybrid influence have increased a lot on the, on the Baltic Sea. Cyber threats have grown, and even the risk of military movements up and operations ha has also increased. And this has huge impacts to maritime shipping also. And how we are, pre are prepared. As many of you know, in Finland we have a security strategy for society, which lays out the general principles of preparedness in Finnish society. 
In the strategy, the importance of the national fleet is recognized. Management of security of supply in maritime is based on operating models of normal conditions and open markets. But in serious crises, the authorities have possibilities to guide and, if needed, to order ships registered in Finland as well as the Finnish shipping companies. We also have a system where seafarers are exempted from armed service to serve security of supply. And the Finnish government also has the option of providing insurance guarantees for ships in, situ in situations where commercial insurance is not available. And my final slide, how to ensure maritime security of supply in Finland in this case. In crisis, for the country like Finland, seafarers and own ice classes fleet under national flag is vital. During World War II, it was noticed how important own fleet is for the security of supply. But it was not easy. Eighty Finnish merchant ships were destroyed and hundreds of sailors died while transporting important cargo and war supplies to Finland. Finnish General Adolf Andrut once said, a nation that does not know its history cannot build its future. I think that those were very wise words. History must, must not be forgotten and we have to learn from the history. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a law where government can give insurance guarantees for ships in situations where commercial insurance is not available. This kind of situation comes, comes quite quickly if there is a safety risks. And then we have maritime transport pool. The pool includes about 70 companies that are critical for security of supply. And to, the pool promotes open collaboration between authorities and companies. And I must say that the collaboration between authorities and industry is working very well. It's absolutely one of the strengths of the Finnish cooperation, as said already before. And the pool organizes also training and exercises um, for risk management and securing business operations. And we have, for example, published a cybersecurity best practice guidance for ship owners and, and vessels. I would say that uh, we are quite well prepared. But from the point of view of the con continuity of sea transport, in Sweden, there is one important tool that we do not have. Sweden has its own law that enables a state guarantee and financing for ship investments that have a national interest. And you even have an own organization for that, for that SEPS hypothek. I think it's very important that we learn from each others. And this event, for example, and this cooperation is an excellent possibility to do so. Thank you. Petri, please uh, take the stage. Uh, Tina, you mentioned the importance of learning from the history. Do you believe that we are good in that perspective? Well, I, I think, well, partly, maybe partly, but I think it's at least in this situation what we are living at the moment, we should learn more, much, much more. Mm. Do you have any concrete examples of how you, we can learn more from each other and cross-border? Well, I think this, well, that was one example what I men mentioned, this own fleet. Yeah. But I think we also could cooperate more. Mm. I don't know, well, I, I do know that when we, when we were in the war, there were, we got a lot of help from Sweden. Mm -hmm. It was very, very important for Finland. Even from indi individual persons, 
they came to fight for Finland. Mm. So I have only, <laughs> well, warm memories of the cooperation from uh, wars when it comes to Sweden and Finland. Thank you so much. Petri, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So every, everybody, it's, it's an honor to be here and, and, and I'm very, very pleased to tell you a bit about one exercise. M my old colleague Katarina was talking about how, how she likes exercises and, and to exercise. And this is a good example of, of how we can exercise also internationally and, and, and cooperate between Sweden and Finland. So in September, we were hosting a tabletop exercise focusing on hybrid threats to renewable energy system. And this time we were, we were practicing that we were running a, a windmill farm. Uh, uh, about Nordic Pine, last year it was held only in Sweden. And, and it's a, like a big effort of, of um, the Swedish Total Defense Foundation or Total Försvars Stiftelsen and, and, and NATO Science and Technical Organization. So this is a real joint opera operation between um, VTT, Swedish RISE or RISE, and uh, NATO Science and Technical Organization, but also this um, Naval Postgraduate School. So a real joint operation. Um, the first day was about cyber. So there, the whole day was, was, was a pretty hectic uh, incidents coming in all, all the day. Uh, and, and basically, then uh, different companies, that they were solving these issues together. So, so no company was, was actually practicing alone. But it's, it, uh, the groups were a mixture of, of several companies. And the reason for that it was that basically the companies saw, saw the situation totally dif differently. There were companies who were, which were operating in Sweden and in Finland in both countries, and they had real uh, uh, ready processes for this kind of, of incidents. And, and really small companies only running in, in Finland or in Sweden and, and without any real processes for this kind of situation. So, so the take also the takeouts were a bit different regard regarding of, of which kind of companies we were talking about. What, so first day cyber, uh, and as we all, all might know, for example, Finnish windmills are, are operated mainly abroad, for example, from Spain. So that means that they are, contact, they are in contact in networks, so they are, they are networked and, and basically very easily then uh, also accessed and attacked by, for example, some foreign country. We all know that Russia is having the same playbook than the Soviet Union used to have. So that, that's one of the reasons why, why we need to practice all the time. Uh, the second day was about malign information, so information influence against uh, our windmill farm. And as you know, we have been reading all about the exploding bats and, and microplastics coming out, out from the windmills. And, and also some, uh, some other issues that are, are you know, the sound, sound is, is going to affect people and, and, and animals and environment. So, so the second day was practicing practicing ab 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 against malign information influence. Uh, about the, still about the companies, there were 29 different organizations practicing in, in, in this, so it, it was quite a large organization. Uh, and also oh, the, the public was about, there were organizations in the Finnish and Swedish energy ecosystem. So big companies, small companies, also authorities where they're like, they're like Cyber Security Center and, and NESA. This practice has um, really bold objectives to inspire and initialize uh, international cooperation. And, and that's one of the reasons why we have plans. Now we are already planning the next year's Nordic Pine. 
and the idea is to enlarge the, the uh, practice also to other NATO countries like Norway, Denmark, and Baltic countries. So, like, enlarge the group of, of, of practicing countries. And, of course, we were... So, hybrid, actually... What is, that, what is hybrid influence? It's, it's practice, practically anything. So, so, cyber, information, but also some, some, some other ways, ways to influence... Uh, societies and, and, and companies. And the idea is to continue to practice this because we haven't already noticed that, that the, the hybrid influence is, is going to increase and going to be stronger and stronger depending on, on the international security situation, uh, which should be read like Russia and, and China, for example. If you want to no, I, I think I've used my five minutes, so if you want to know more about this, you can read more about it in, in the Total First Vasiftelsen web pages and also VTT's web pages. Um, and I'm really excited to plan the next year's e exercise already, so that was great fun. Thank you so much. So I will try a different strategy now. Uh, uh, oh, great. Uh, not only will I open up for question, I will open up for the opportunity to give a short, short comment uh, or a short reflection. So uh, if we can have a microphone over here. Sir, please raise your hand uh, and state your name and organization. Finnish food and drinks industries preparedness. I would like to ask Håkan, do you, are you aware, are the Ukrainian authorities regulating in some way uh, which industrial resources are available for who? Or is it still a market-driven process for everyone? No, well, the state can basically expropriate whatever they want. For instance, trucks from our customers or, or trucks from our leasing portfolio. So, so we're under war laws. I think we have one more question. Hello, my name is Erik Sandström and I work for the Swedish Trade Union Confederation. So I have a little bit more of a worker's perspective. And given Håkan's presentation, I thought it was fascinating that you talked about shelters close to the workplace. And I would just like to undermine that that's a really important area in Sweden where, for example, we build new factories such as Northvolt is one example without one single shelter. While in Finland, I believe you still have a rule that if you're building over 1,500 square meters, you need to build shelters for, for uh, the workers in the factory. And given what we've seen in Russia and from the pictures we saw from Ukraine, <clears throat> I think that that's a really important uh, aspect to, to bring with us. Also in the area of energy, when it comes to the workers' perspective, I would like to highlight that many of the main Swedish power companies don't have their own employees anymore that can actually do repair work, etc. They're normally dependent on workers from other countries, such as Ukraine. And in a more bigger European crisis, we fear that those workers maybe need to go home and protect their own country and their own energy supply systems. So I thought it was a really interesting comment on relying more on national networks also in times of, of crisis. So that would be the comment that you, that you asked for. But it would be interesting to hear, for example, if you have drawn more conclusions from Ukraine, for example, with regards to what we can do in Sweden and Finland to, to just have more reliable systems, also from a worker's perspective, because we know in terms of crisis, many of the people that has to go to work could be a lorry driver or someone building trucks. Thank you, sir. Tina, do you have any comments? No? No? Håkan? Uh, well, uh, to find workers is increasingly problematic. And one of the issues that we have, uh, we are a white company, we pay all the taxes, we report everything that we need to do. That means that as soon as we employ someone, we have to report to the draft office that we have this guy and has these qualifications. So by accepting an employment with us, they're exposing themselves mm. to the draft offices. And, and well, we understand why, of course, and, and without the uh, army, we wouldn't have our business at all, but uh, this is quite complicated. Mm. 
Thank you. Petri, uh, regarding the exercise Nordic Pine, you, you feel it seems like it's, it was a very um, easy task to contribute. Can you give any insights on the challenges with putting this exercise together short? Uh, yes, few challenges, of, of course, when th there are people planning the exercise from, from three or four different countries, we have even that time difference. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, everything went, went, went really smoothly, so, so I wouldn't say that we, we had difficulties in, in, in plan, planning it. We quite quite soon agreed about the, like, which kind of rehearsal we will have and, and, w and what will happen during the days. Mm -hmm. So, not really. That's good to hear. So maybe in the true Hanna Holman spirit, an invitation to Tina and Håkan for the next year's exercise? Yes, definitely. <laughs> Tina, what can you say top of mind when listening to Håkan and Petri that we can learn from each other? I mean, you all, all three of you represent very different type of case examples. What can we learn from each other? A lot. Uh, <laughs> we can learn, of course, a lot. I think it's, well, we have also, I think we have participated to practice some, well, partly the water transport pool, I think so. But for example, the practicing, I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. And I would would maybe like that if we would have a, some kind of uh, practice where we practice the uh, sea transportation on, on Baltic Sea, that's very common, that's common uh, challenge for Sweden and Finland. I think we, we haven't had that kind of practice, or I don't know if you had mm. that as a part of the practice. That's one thing. And I'm sure that we have a lot to learn from you, but we need to discuss a little bit more about <laughs> all the, how it, things work in Ukraine. Uh, I think we, the, the probably there is a lot of benchmarking for the cases if we had the same situation, what is in Ukraine at the moment. Mm. That's great. Yeah, the sure is, and I would encourage you all to visit Kiev. Mm. Will you host the, the us? More, the more for, yeah, I, would, I would be pleased to host you. Mm -hmm. the, the more foreigners there are in the city, uh, I mean, that's a show, for, uh, I mean, that's a way to show support also, mm. that we go there. That's great. Petri, last words goes to you. Thanks. So, uh, just closing this, this is that um, you can't be a champion without exercising and even the champions exercise. Mm. That, that's an applaud. <laughs> Petri, Tina and Håkan, thank you so much for sharing your insights. And my friend, it's time for a well-deserved coffee break. So please uh, feel free to cross-border interact and be back uh, at 11.40.
Please take your seats. So let's challenge ourselves and please be seated in 30 seconds. Ten seconds to go. My friends, uh, welcome back from a well-deserved coffee break. I hope that the coffee was refreshing and the conversations as well. So now it's my great honor and a big pleasure to warmly welcome Sweden's Minister for Civil Defense to the stage, Carl Oskar Bolin. We will also have the pleasure to listening to the Finnish Minister of the Interior, Marie Rantanen, although through a pre-recorded speech. That being said, Minister Bolin, the floor is yours. Thank you, distinguished guests, or I would prefer to say family and friends, because that is what it feels like standing here in front of you today. I am uh, truly honored to be here, um, and it feels like such a privilege that I had the opportunity that uh, during the morning, sitting here and listening to uh, the various topics that has been discussed, and these have been of up utmost importance, and I truly appreciate that the focus of this conference this year uh, is regarding, uh, among other things, uh, security of supply, because that is a very pressing matter for us to, to handle jointly. Almost to the day a year ago, I stood here as the first minister for civil defense to take office in Sweden since the end of Second World War. My first visit abroad went to this place, to Finland and Hanna Holmen. And that is, of course, no coincidence, because it marks the importance of this venue, but it also, of course, marks the very strong bonds between our countries. Finland is our closest ally, needless to say. And Finland represents what has to be considered the gold standard when it comes to the work of civil preparedness and resilience. There is no denying that um, we find ourselves in the midst of a paradigm shift. Or perhaps, as someone said, when people start talking about paradigm shifts, it has already taken place. To paraphrase Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, it happened gradually, then suddenly, in the front of our eyes. In all bad things that this development has brought with it, new strength has also been revealed. I'm not only talking about the heroism and bravery shown by the Ukrainian people on the battlefield when being face, faced with a full-scale war and ruth, ruthless uh, Russian aggression, but also, of course, of the deepened relations between Western countries who believe in the same values and in the rules-based world order. Sweden and Finland's accession to NATO is just one example of this. For the first time since the Second World War, a large-scale war is being fought within our vicinity on the European continent. Russia's full-scale and illegal invasion of Ukraine and war um, against Ukraine 
shows us no mercy and demonstrates boundless contempt for the European security order. So when the people of Ukraine is fighting for their own survival and, and freedom, they are also fighting for our security and our values. Ukraine is our shield to Russia's military expansion, and therefore Ukraine's cause is, of course, our cause. Finland and Sweden has a similar approach to total defense, and our perspective are cohesive to NATO's views on resilience and civil preparedness and the seven, seven baseline requirements. Once Sweden completes its NATO accessions, uh, we could work shoulder to shoulder with Finland in raising the bar generally with the work on civil preparedness and resilience within the alliance. In this regard, both of our countries really has something substantial. Uh, we, we have su substantial contributions to make um, uh, within this regard. And the last year's developments on the European uh, continent have shown us how crucial this really is. Sweden is now in the phase of rebuilding our total defense concept. And that does not only manifest, manifest in a historical in increase of defense spending, taking us above the 2% of GDP mark already next year, but also in the fact that we take a whole of society approach to the matter. We are now building a structure for civil defense, both geographical and sectorial wise. We are reinstituting uh, civil conscription, starting with the rescue services, moving forward to the um, um, energy sector, and we're looking to do it more broadly uh, across society. We are putting new investments in, into getting uh, the readiness up of our shelter and civil protection. We are spending more money on, on the rescue services, and we are now undertaking a start to provide a better security of supply also in Sweden. Maintaining the will to defend is intimately linked to a society that is robust and capable of upholding its basic function. But the will to defend must also be, be translated into the capability to defend. And that is, of course, starting with every individual as well as securing robust public structures. Every individual within our societies needs to be having a clear understanding of their role in a modern total defense. In Sweden, every citizen between the age 16 and 70 years old is subject to total defense duty. But for many in Sweden today, it is not clear how that duty would materialize. And that is a challenge that we face and a challenge that cannot be solved by the government alone. Because presently, I dare to say that there is no task within total defense that can be solved sustainably in the long term without the participation of industry and the business community. This places significant demands both on the government and the business sector. A comprehensive investigation with this specific focus is currently being handled at the Swedish Ministry of Defense. Finnish NISA is, of course, one of our role models, as well as the need to find a solution that fits today's challenges. Very shortly, the Swedish government will present how some step, quick steps can be taken towards better supply preparedness. And it's very encouraging to see in today's program that the role of the business community in resilience work is truly on the agenda, as I mentioned, and that solution, solutions developed by the business sector itself, including flexible preparedness, for example, 
are also highlighted as a good example, which I find very encouraging. Finland and Sweden stand, st stand side by side in difficult time, and con contexts like these bring our countries closer together and create opportunities for us to do more things together and to build our collective resilience against antagonists threatening our way of life and the values we stand for in a more multipolar and insecure world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister Bolin. Please join me here. You mentioned that Sweden and Finland has a similar approach towards total defense, and the very essence of what we have done here today is also cooperation and collaboration. In an increasingly interconnected world, what type of innovative <coughs> strategies or frameworks do you believe that we can implement to facilitate cross-border cooperation to, to boost our crisis preparedness and civil defense strategies? And what can Sweden do towards its neighboring countries? Well, I, I think it's, um, it's very important that during the times that we find ourselves in, we don't know how long, um, how long time we have before uh, we stand the risk of, of, of being put to the test ultimately, so to speak. I think it's very important that uh, we don't sort of trying to invent the wheel on, on our own when there is uh, good examples around us mm -hmm. coming from countries that we share uh, uh, the same values and, and, and viewpoints with. And I think that the obvious example for, for Sweden is, is to strengthen the cooperation with Finland, but I think there is... Uh, also something for, for Finland in this uh, to gain. As we have uh, seen from the, the panelists uh, previous today, there is uh, a lot of ingenu ingenuity um, uh, stemming from, from the fact that, of, cor of course, it was, it was a big, big mistake for, for Sweden to roll back its total defense concept during the times of relaxation. But in some ways, it sort of provides us with a cleaner slate today. We're not we're not stuck in a in an old structure, and I think, for example, the the example of of, of uh, um, <clears throat> that was shown from from example, Amexi today shows the ingenuity that that derives from from from, from Sweden um, uh, right now, and I think that is something that we can bring to the table. Whereas you still have, uh, whereas Finland still have the. Uh, the institutions left in a way that is, is also, of course, very fruitful for, for a deep co cooperation. Mm. Of course, and, and that is one of the things that I will learn from today, that, as you said, we Sweden has a clean slate. We can start from the beginning, which, which is also very uh, a very good posture. Cre we have the possibility to be flexible and creative. Uh, so how do you think that Sweden could work to enhance collaboration with neighboring countries in order to get more efficient resource sharing and information sharing in the context of civil defense or crisis preparedness? Well, I just uh, finished uh, uh, bilateral with my, my ministerial uh, colleague, uh, Minister Rantanen. Mm -hmm. And it was a very open and fruitful discussion, and, and we are um, very much on the same page here, here in our view that we need to uh, get to the point where we are holding more, uh, having more exchange between our, our two countries, where we have more uh, exercises also within the framework of, of uh, civil preparedness. And I think it's just about us uh, sending that message to uh, all actors uh, in, in uh, society within this regard, that this is, this is uh, the expectation mm. from the highest political level, that we do more things together, that we cooperate, and that we, and that we exercise together. Because I, I think I said in, 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 uh, in the um, uh, SNS event that I know that uh, some of the participants here also were, were attending, that uh, when, when push comes to shove, you, you have a tendency to, 
to don't rise to the occasion, you sink to the level of your training. Someone said that, and I think it's ring, it rings true, because you need to be uh, you need to be well trained, and you need to be prepared for for what lies ahead. And uh, in that regard, having uh, exercises over common tasks is very important. If I could end, I know that you have to leave, if I could end by asking you the same question as I did to the Deputy Assistant Secretary General. If you can have some dreams for the future from the stance that the security environment will remain the same for a long time ahead, what would that be? Well, <laughs> alluding to the um, predominating uh, topic of this uh, conference uh, when it comes to the securities of supply, when I came here, fresh in the role a year ago, uh, I also had the opportunity to visit NISA. Uh, as I mentioned in my speech, we've just received the inquiry setting out sort of a roadmap for instituting a, a better system for security of, of supply and, and preparedness in, in Sweden. And we are now taking our first step, as I mentioned, by, by uh, which I will get back to within just a matter of days. So I hope within a year from now that that work has uh, better taken off in Sweden and paved the way for uh, more of a cooperation, for example, with NISA from the uh, uh, MSB, the Swedish Civil Contingency Agency, because we need to step out the work in this, in this regard. And I hope that in a year from now that we see that that work has taken off. That sounds great. And on that note, I would like to thank you so much for taking time. And please join me in applauding the civil minister, minister for civil defense. Thank you. Thank you. So we have reached the point where we uh, are listening to a pre-recorded speech from uh, Minister uh, Koloskar Bolin's opponent here in Finland, Marie uh, Rantanen. Dear participants, thank you for the opportunity through this video greeting to give some comments from the Ministry of the Interior's part in the Hanna Holmen Initiative Summit. Unfortunately, I cannot attend personally due to some changes in my schedule. The ongoing crisis in the world and in our close neighborhood affects us every day in many ways. The news constantly feed us images and the information on wars, conflicts and areas affected by natural disasters. One thing has become clear. The war in Ukraine has specifically shown us that a key element in war alongside military defense capability is the ability to protect the citizens and the critical infrastructure and this way ensure the survival of citizens and the conditions for defense in general. The resilience of society is essential, especially in a prolonged war. The help need in Ukraine is immense and we will continue the support as long as, it, as needed. Resilience of crisis preparedness has continued to develop in an even more important policy area, also in EU and NATO. This new political importance is also reflected in recent political declarations of EU and NATO, lastly in conclusions adopted by European Council late October. It is important to remember that resilience is first of all matter of national competence. Every country shall build or at least maintain its own preparedness, not outsource it. Since few crises are concentrated in one country, it's important that, for example, EU can strengthen its overall EU resilience in a whole of society approach. This, of course, would support and strengthen national preparedness. 
The Ministry of the Interior is an essential actor in a building up resilience. Questions and duties related to civil preparedness, rescue services, police, border security and civil intelligence, just to mention a few. What about the question discussed here? How can two countries, Finland and Sweden, strengthen de their preparedness together? In the government program, it stated that the government will ensure good relations with Sweden, which is Finland's closest partner. The cooperation in the area of civil preparedness is already very close. I have met my colleague Minister Bullin in September in Stockholm and now I had the possibility to meet him here in Hanaholmen and we continued the discussions. I know that civil servants in our ministries know each other very well and are in close contacts weekly if not daily. Same applies to the cooperation on the operational level, MSB. So, my answer to the question is that you need to know your counterpart to be able to work together with them. The idea of the Hanna Holmen initiative is in the line with this and we support the work done. In this context, it's also important, important not to forget the Nordic co cooperation in this field. In the government program, it's also stated that Finland will improve Nordic cooperation in preparedness and security of supply. Therefore, we are supporting the work of Haga and the work, of, the work Sweden has been doing during this, their chairmanship this year. But what can be done concretely? When Finland and Sweden both have become members of the NATO alliance, the role of the Baltic Sea region is highlighted for the common security, also including civil preparedness. We can see that both EU and NATO resilience must be discussed in coherence and there might be areas to be taken forward together in both fora in an appropriate way. Meanwhile, we can continue to cooperate in other fields, for example, with common bilateral exercises. We also need to closely keep each other informed on specific events as the Baltic Connector case. The closer cooperation on every field between our governments on every level need to continue. I'm sure you feel today in the, in the end of this course that you have learned new things and that you got to know new colleagues and friends. I hope that you can use the knowledge you have gained in various relevant contexts. All this is very important when our countries continue to work for even more resilient societies. Together we are stronger. Thank you. Although she didn't have the possibility to join us here, it is very nice to also listen to uh, Carlos Carbolin's Finnish counterpart. With that said, it is time for one of the highlights of today, one of many highlights of today's program. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, this year's participants from the Executive Education Program. Please join me in welcoming Per Arvidsson, Executive Vice President, CTO Lantmännen. A warm applause. Erika Brundin, Deputy General Secretary, Secretary and Director, Executive Director, Church of Sweden. Warmly welcome. <laughs> Marin Holm Johansson, Governor, State Department of Åland. Warmly welcome. <laughs> and last but not least, Aro Toivonen, Director of Security and Preparedness, Hass Group. Warmly welcome.
so my friends, we, I'm, I'm very delighted to have uh, all of you here. And uh, my open up question would be something like, in what way do you believe? I mean, the true essence of what we have talked about here today is the collaboration and the importance of knowing our counterparts. So in what way do you believe that the Hanna Holman Initiative can contribute to fostering cross-cultural understanding and collaboration from your perspective? Who would like to start? Yeah, that's good. That's a great idea. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to this panel. It's a great honor to be here. And uh, but in 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 a kind of more ideological on a level like that, it's it's of course very important to have these connections mm -hmm. <laughs> we have just built and. Every year we go further, there will be 20 more of, of, the, of, of these kind of points of contact in, in different regions of, of, of industry and, and administration and so forth. And, and that will build, build a connection uh, during time. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, we will have, hopefully, more common planning and then more exercises. Mm. Because we have to have something to exercise, <laughs> mm. but if we don't have the, the 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 kind of planning, common planning, then it's it's difficult. Mm. And I would add one more. I think when we all go back to our works, we we kind of start to find out what is uh, uh, are there some legal or other aspects why we are not doing it already. So there has to be some reasons why we are not exercising with, with Stockholm area. There would be, uh, why are we not doing that? Mm. There are, uh, well, when we are doing, talking about national defense or civil defense, so there, are, there are certainly issues that we can share with everybody. Mm. So this is the mindset that is, is I'm bringing home mm. <laughs> to my work. So, so what, what is your view? You, you state the question, why are we not doing it already? What is your view? Uh, I don't know. We have a, a long tradition of, of taking care of our own business, so mm. to say. Mm. <laughs> and and uh, uh, the national defense. It's, it's a kind of ideological thing. Mm. And, it's, uh, and al also with regard to NATO accession, it's, it's, uh, it's a technical issue. It's a, it's a multifaceted issue. But on the mental side, it's a huge leap. Mm. It's a huge kind of framework, mm. uh, and that 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 is also in Sweden <laughs> going to be. But true, that's my my yeah. kind of reflection. Manin, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I think you said um, why are we not doing it before. Well, uh, I'm not sure I knew that I could, yeah. because mm. uh, I I come from the Orland Islands and that's in Finland, mm. so. Am I allowed to reach out to Sweden and start talking preparedness mm. that has to do with the country's safety? Uh, I didn't know. But this open, uh, opens up new opportunities, new connections, and I feel we can. Mm. We, we are allowed to reach out and, and cooperate in these areas. Mm. So, so, do you believe that um, the sense of uh, do I know if I can reach out to my uh, Swedish colleagues is that a legislative issue or is a cult or is it a cultural issue? Well, I think when we are working with preparedness, we are taught that we should keep it secret. Yeah, it's not mm -hmm. supposed to tell everyone how we are working mm. with preparedness. Mm. So. Uh, but now I, I see we, there's a lot of opportunities to still learn from yeah, how course. things are done. Mm. We don't have to tell all the secret things, mm. but we can still cooperate. And still share uh, exp experience and yes. insights, yes. But we can also practice together. Mm. Since I'm coming from a Swedish-speaking part of Finland, uh, we have this problem that um, how can we teach uh, the, and practice in Sweden mm. when uh, it's difficult to, to have um, instructors fr uh, from Finland to teach in Swedish. Mm. That's Im so this opens up new opportunities for us. Mm. Hanna Holmen mentality. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Erika, go ahead. 
Thank you. And first of all, thank you for uh, being invited to take part of this uh, executive program, which has been very rewarding. So thank you, everyone, for who has made that possible in different ways. Uh, I, uh, I think uh, the, the possibilities are, of course, in the relations and the networks that we have been allowed to build, and that will be even enlarged when I get to learn the alumni from the previous two years and from the coming years. So, so that's a uh, tremendous asset. But I would also like to add not only the relations and the, and the networks, but also the motivation to use it. And, and uh, coming from the church, uh, when we talk about inter-religious dialogue, we are taught to, tr uh, to uh, try to practice um, not to compare the best in our own context with the worst in someone else's, mm. uh, but to practice what we call holy envy. And uh, I think the Hannah Holman Initiative has provided an arena, if not for, if not holy, so then wholesome mm. envy. At least for, I think I speak for my Swedish co-years, that we have had, a, we have a lot to learn, and which inspires and motivates us when we, when we go back to our own contexts. Mm. What, what would you say is? Um your biggest highlight from your for your participation in the program? I think um, th there have been uh, like a whole, uh, I have a whole uh, <laughs> string <laughs> of pearls yeah. actually uh, from, uh, from, these, uh, from these days. Uh, I think some of the exercises we have made together, which, has, which is also a different way of getting to getting to learn each other, getting to know each other and also getting to know what do we contribute when we sit at the uh, same table that's one of uh, those experiences and one of the things that I bring with me that has been very inspiring is to see how Finland has managed to bring all sectors to the table mm. the public sector the business sector, but also the civil society sector to the same table in these issues. And I think that is uh, very inspiring and I'm, I'm sure that, um, and I hope that Sweden will follow suit. Mm. Keep that thought, Per, from your perspective. Yeah, I'm also very honored uh, to be invited to this uh, high quality program. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and my perspective is, uh, and I'm representing the industry more precisely here, the the food, several steps of the food industry, the food supply chain. And, and we have in Landman and been engaged and working with the preparedness issue from that perspective since many, many years. Uh, we are also uh, active in Finland. Finland is our second largest market, so we, we're part of the, the, the Finnish resilience system uh, within the company. Having said that, I still have learned a lot from this program. Mm. Uh, New perspectives, uh, of course, all different kinds of learnings, but the main value, I would say, is, is uh, you uh, and, and you here, the network as such, the, the personal relations, uh, which are actually contacts and expansion of my network uh, across society mm. that would have been hard to, to reach uh, by myself. Mm. Uh, on top of that, I would also like to compliment the... the, the um, the education as such, the program as such, the contributions from both the Finnish and the Swedish sides, MSP, University of Defense, and NESA, and the corresponding uh, University of Defense in Finland. It's, it's a high quality uh, training, uh, which is worthwhile the eight days that you put in. Uh, it's, it's quite a lo lot of time you put in. And I'm careful with my time. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I must say, compliments to to uh, the ones that has, has been uh, designing and heading the program. Mm. That's great. So uh, coming back to the importance of the network and the new bi bridges bi building here, what would you say that you can take back in your role and capacity at Landman and in order of the network context? Well, I, I have already planned, so I'm planning a meeting with Aro here. He <laughs> take me through the details because I want to know the details about the pool system. Mm. Because what we're about, what we need to do in Sweden is to set up the operative models to stop discussing and s discussing and start acting. Mm. So uh, that's just one example. Mm. Uh, there are other people that I will set up meetings with. Mm. 
And I would like to underline as well, I forgot to say that, it's great with the expanded network in Finland, but as useful is the Swedish contacts that I've got, mm. uh, which I wouldn't have came across, I think, otherwise. Which is wonderful. Uh, let's once again open up for uh, questions. I will remove the opportunity to give comments at this uh, point, so only questions from the audience. Uh, Erika and Marie, what would you say um, from the context of the education program that you can, uh, if, if I ask you this question in, in one year, what type of concrete examples of the con collaboration do you think that you will provide me and the audience with? If you can dream. I'll start. Yeah. So uh, uh, I think when I come back in a year, uh, I will tell you about the memorandum of understanding that Church of Sweden, and Church of Finland, and Church of Norway, mm. preempting a possible enlargement of the Hanna Holmen Initiative, uh, is uh, currently working on as a result of the Hanna Holmen Initiative, and uh, which we then will have finalized and uh, in in uh, strengthening our ability to. Uh, 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 receive refugees from each other mm. or uh, other aspects of our responsibilities, for example. So that would be one thing. Another one is that I will have brought home the idea of the green button that I learned from uh, the Stockholm region, and I know the I know the previous co-years also uh, also liked that idea, and I will have brought that home to my o own organization. I will tell you the results of that. That's great, Marie. Thank you. Well, I, I uh, am hoping that I'm sitting here and telling you that I have, uh, I, I plan for a local training program that includes uh, people responsible for preparedness in different on different levels, and I would like to invite experts. Um, uh, starting out seminars and then continuing with mm. workshops. I think this Hannah Holloman initiative shows me that this is a very fruitful way of working uh, to, to have these workshops together. And um, I would like to start cross-sector interactions and activities so that people in different groups learn to know each other. Mm. And they, they know not only by name, but they have a, a good communication. And um, I would promote exercises on regular basis, mm -hmm. so not only once a year or so so often as possible, so that they know the, the drills. And um, and also I I would like to contact areas and regions that are similar have similar problems to us. I just cut the card a few minutes ago from Gotland, mm. and that makes me really happy because now I have a counterpart on Gotland. And that is the true essence of building bridges. Yeah, yeah? Aru, from your perspective. Well, this is something different now. <laughs> I'm saying after, after, after you. Um, I'm a great fan of maps. And, and uh, what I bring home, uh, in our, I, I come from the medical side. HUS means Hospital District of Helsinki and Uusimaa. So we have 20, mm -hmm. 23 hospitals in, in, in this region. And, and um, I realized that we have had a too small a map in our planning. And it will go to, to <laughs> we have, we'll, we'll have a broader, broader picture in the, in the planning in the future. So of course, it's a national thing, but, but on the other hand, Cooperation can be done between organizations like Stock region of Stockholm and HUS. Uh, so, so th this has been uh, not non-existent, so non not non-existent, but very, very small scale uh, kind of cooperation that I will bring. Mm, that's great. Pat, uh, would you say that you, I, I know that one of the important factors of the program is to learn about uh, uh, each other's crisis preparedness system. Would you say that you have learned more about the Finnish system? Yeah, definitely. Mm. Even though I, I thought I knew <laughs> a lot before, <laughs> before, I've learned more. So the answer is yes, mm. without doubt. Yeah. Can you give any concrete examples? 
Well, I, I, uh, I deepen and widen my, my uh, knowledge. Uh, one precise um, example is the hybrid center that I didn't knew that that existed at all. And that's, uh, as I understand it, an EU center of competence. But that's one precise example. I, uh, that was very, very interesting, mm. very useful. Um, but that's one concrete example. That's great. Erika, from your uh, perspective, have you learned more about the Finnish system? Oh, I've learned uh, a lot, and I didn't know as much as you did. I, um, uh, uh, well, <laughs> I, I knew even less, I think, so I learned a lot. I, uh, it was, uh, for me, it was very, very interesting to the day we spent with NESA, and uh, also the exercises we did, but also just uh, understanding how that whole system is built up and... and uh, the whole idea of that system with the with the three uh, three parts of that, which which was really um, really interesting and uh, thought provoking, also from from my perspective. In the when it comes to uh, security of supply, of course, the church is not a main actor in terms of production or or logistics or transportation, but we do have a role mm -hmm. when it comes to, for example, reaching uh, reaching the most vulnerable. And uh, being able to also secure supply for for groups that are far from um, the general society, then the church plays a role. So to understand that system and to think about how we can contribute in uh, building up Sweden has been very interesting. Marin, go ahead. Well, I, I learn a lot, but I mostly I feel I want to learn more. Mm. Um, there's so many questions, and I, and I want to dig in deeper and uh, see how they work practically mm. and, and so on. Mm. Mm. I think the course management is very satisfied with your answers. <laughs> uh, Aro, go yeah. ahead. Of course, uh, this has been a tremendous learning exp experience. I've learned also from the Finnish system. Mm. I worked here in the system for 22 years now <laughs> and still learning. And, uh, um, but, but from the Swedish system, I thought I knew something about, about it, uh, but I noticed I didn't know, know anything, <laughs> actually. <laughs> so so that, that's a pretty good start. <laughs> and and uh, maybe I, w I was impressed about the, the psychological uh, defense. Mm. The, in Finland, we, we don't have a clear uh, responsible for, for that issue. Maybe we take it for granted that we are not afraid. <laughs> So, uh, but but that's that, that's not the real answer <laughs> here. So so in Sweden, you you have a kind of tackled the issues better better than we here. So we there we have to do some homework, mm. obviously. Mm. Uh, keep the microphone. We ha we had the advantage to listen to uh, Katarina and you won the alumnus from uh, uh, last year's program. Next year, all four of you will be alumnus in the program. Please, with one or two words, can you tell me? What you, uh, if I get the privilege to be the moderator next year, what will you uh, tell me when I ask you what you have uh, completed in concrete examples together with your Finnish, uh, with your Swedish colleagues? Well, first of all, we will be meeting in Stockholm, uh, and you will be presenting the Swedish pool system yeah. to us, <laughs> and then we will, will <laughs> we had some exercises already with with Ricard, yeah. with a. Uh, Stockholm area and, and HUS group mm. within the medicine part, but hospitals. I, I'm taking notes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And the, only, only for us here. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Something like this. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Marin, go ahead. Yeah, I um, was very... Um, uh, the, 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 the center of... Um, European Center of uh, uh, Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats, that was a very new knowledge for me. Mm. And uh, it, it impressed me that uh, there's so much knowledge about countering um, uh, these uh, methods for countering these attacks and strategies for even politicians, how to meet uh, these attacks and how um, important they are, mm. uh, not to take them you know, they are not uh, a small things, you know, they are really a threat to the society. So I uh, think the first thing I will do is try to get somebody uh, from the, some expert from the center to the Wallen Islands. That's great. Uh, lecture. Mm, that's great. Thank you so much, Erika. 
so I will I will tell you about how I hooked up with the civil society representative in the suite, in the Finnish uh, security committee and learned from that person uh, uh, how that cooperation has been working and uh, and how I sold that to the Swedish uh, <laughs> government. So I will tell you about that and um, and I will also uh, tell you about how I uh, hooked up with some of my Swedish uh, colleagues and for example uh, how I think we can strengthen, strengthen our collaboration with the regions uh, coming from not only the church but also from we work together, the, the five major actors within Swedish civil society. So I think we can hook up with the regions. We've been focusing on the landstyrelse that we have in Sweden, but we will now uh, approach the regions also because we, I think we have a lot to contribute. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Last but not least. Thank you. I, I hope uh, that a year from now that I can talk about uh, that about 2024 as the year when Sweden got out of the starting gate uh, with the fit for purpose operative model that made us uh, begin the development work mm. because it's it's quite some development work. But with that, that and, and that we have come into concrete uh, actions. Uh, and with that, or uh, with that as a platform, we can definitely talk about joint development and joint efforts between Sweden and Finland. Because I think there are, for sure, combining the resources of those two countries, um, finding the optimal, most efficient, not the least cost efficient solutions, because this is going to cost, uh, as we heard here from several, the, the resilience is not for free. No. Um, if we combine our resources in the right way, Mm. Uh, it's for the benefit of of both, of course, and cost more cost efficient than we do it one by one. And more of a whole society approach. Right. Yeah. So with that said, I would like to thank uh, Aro, Marin, Erika and Per so much for sharing their insights from the program. A warm applaud. My friends, this high level uh, summit, uh, the, the, this year's high level summit is coming to a close. Uh, but I would like to welcome Camilla Asp, Deputy Director General at the Swedish Civil Contingency Agency. A warm applaud. <laughs> and I would like to welcome Petri Korvala, Secretary General of the Security Committee here in Finland. Also, a warm applaud. Our task here today is to collectively summarize this Hanna Holman Initiative Summit. And I will start by turning to you, Camilla, for your uh, reflections. So it's not easy. No. It's been a lot of good speeches. Thank you for that. Um, I think to have a strong defense, both uh, military and uh, civil defense, you need a robust society, you need a flexible society. And not the least, you need a committed society. And we had so many good examples of that today. And uh, I have three examples from the business sector. Uh, Yuri from to say, Confederation of Finnish Industries. I think you're somewhere around here. Uh, we're talking about a concrete thing they did, the webinars they had each month to, to strengthen, especially small and medium companies to become more resilient. Ed Edwin was talking about uh, 3D printers and uh, uh, innovat innovative uh, technology that could be very useful during crisis and also proved to be useful during the pandemic. And uh, Håkan, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, the, the things they did in uh, or do in Ukraine to support Ukraine, but also still have making business uh, in the countries. Could I give more examples? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting to hear about NATO, the, the, um, the, how they work with the resilience and uh, NATO baselines and how to, for instance, Axel mentioned to coordinate the, the military and the civil defense planning, how important it is. Um, it was very interesting to hear from this year's um, 
participant of the program uh, and also the alumni group. And it was very pleased to hear that you still are in contact with each other and mm. uh, give each other support. Mm. Uh, I think, as many said before, I think this type of uh, meetings where you meet and you need get contact and, and I think it's very important mm. to have a great reflections. Mm. Petri, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I had a similar challenge as, as Camilla to, to select only one thing interesting mm -hmm. today because the program all in all has been extremely well built with relevant topics and high level expertise provided by, by all the briefers. So instead of naming only one, I, I would like to highlight briefly some, uh, some points from each session as, as Camilla did as well, I found important without any priority, priority so if I start from the session one, technology and innovation, I would like to, to, to touch first uh, the changes of the security environment. So, so as highlighted in the speeches, uh, it's not more complicated anymore. It has turned to more and more complex and uh, that underlines the, the, the vitality for cooperation, both on horizontal and vertical di dimensions. So the silo breaking is a requirement. My second point is uh, related to the value of the alumni network. So uh, it became proven very well today again. So uh, with the Hannah Holman mentality, we are able to achieve a lot in our bilateral cooperation. Turning then to, to session two that was focusing to, to critical infrastructure the vital role of uh, pub public sec sector uh, was highlighted in many ways and the importance of understanding the economic system running to our societies is, uh, is a precondition of, uh, of our resilience. European Union and NATO as frameworks, key, ra key frameworks for uh, our resilience development uh, they, they provide us a, a lot of opportunities, but requirements as well. The last session uh, that was focusing to the strengthening of our, our, our cooperation, I would like to highlight uh, the importance of the security of supply as a key element of the society's resilience. Mm -hmm. Importance of com common contribution to security in order to protect the Western values third point I picked up from that session uh, is the, the citizen, uh, citizen's role in, in, uh, in security. So uh, the vitality of uh, will to defend and capability to, to defend is, uh, is uh, something that we have to put a lot of effort to. Exercises mentioned several times today, so, so that is... Uh, uh, very good, one of the very, very good uh, uh, areas how how we can uh, cooperate together more in the future, and all those case examples today related to hybrid threats exercises, uh, maritime transportation, uh, 3D printing, and so on. So so they gave us a lot of uh, practical examples how to do a lot together. So all in all, very valuable morning we have had today. So thank you all, all for this. Thank you so much for your reflection. Camilla, what can you say about how MSB or the Swedish Civil Continuity Agency, uh, what, how you have worked in order to strengthen bilaterally crisis management preparedness and civil defense? So we've been uh, collaborating with Finland uh, for for a long time, and before it was mainly in to, for instance, uh, um, rescue services, we also had a lot of exercises and still have. Uh, we have connected our telecom systems, Virvene uh, Rakel in Sweden, also the Norwegian uh, Nerdnet, so we can communicate across the borders. That are uh, cooperations we had for a long time, but now as we building a new uh, civil defense uh, system for that. Uh, the cooperation has uh, changed a bit. 
So uh, as you also were talking about the security supply is one of the mm. main topics, uh, the, ma the main priorities in Sweden. And uh, we had a lot of cooperation with, uh, for example, NASA or NASA, I should say. Uh, and uh, we got a really lot of help from NASA and uh, appreciate it a lot. And uh, hopefully we can pay back uh, in the future <laughs> <laughs> when we find out something exciting for you. <laughs> so that is one example. Um, we have a lot of cooperation within the cybersecurity area. And uh, I'm also very proud to say that we support the HANA Hall initiatives. We're founding it. Uh, so that's uh, also one way to support the cooperation. Mm, that's a smörgåsbord, as we say in Sweden. Yes, that's mm. a smörgåsbord. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Petri, from your perspective, what I know that uh, maybe you and Camilla meet in different type of contexts. So what have you done from the security committee perspective in order to strengthen crisis, bi bilateral crisis preparedness? Uh, first of all, we have actively identified our counterparts and partners as widely as possible and improved our bilateral networks uh, decisively. The main principle in that has been that, uh, that, uh, that the overlapping is not a problem, so, so uh, there is no need to avoid overlapping. Uh, we will find it later uh, ways to, to avoid it, but, but, uh, but uh, in the early stages it's, uh, it's better to have overlapping instead of uh, having a lot of uncovered areas or, or, or gaps in our our cooperation. Second, we have shared content information and timetables concerning our national comprehensive security strategies. In addition to, to increased, increased knowledge, the goal has also been to identify maybe some common topics that we in the future could, be, could, could include to the strategies of the both countries. We have also exchanged lessons identified and lessons learned from, from the uh, previous and current crisis like uh, COVID pandemics and uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. That has helped us to align our awareness of our security environment and its impact to our own security. And as Camilla, Camilla also mentioned, the, the, the Hanaholm initiative is, uh, is a great example of our bilateral cooperation and uh, it uh, gives us has given us and will give us a lot of added value in the future as well. So in summary, I would like to say that uh, our focus has been now on networking, information exchange, knowledge development. We have to, uh, together created a good foundation to continue and develop our mutual beneficial cooperation in the future. Mm. That's great. If you can end by... Um stating what, what is happening next? What do you think will be put in place in the bilateral uh, cooperation between Sweden and Finland? One key, le key element in the future uh, uh, I would like to highlight is to, to somehow standardize and strengthen those current forms of cooperation that we have identified already providing uh, benefit to both of, both of us. This can be promoted, for example, by increasing the regularity of these uh, value-adding activities. In a nutshell, the proven practices should be reinforced more. Mm. At the same time, we, we also very easily we can also very easily expand our cooperation to new areas by focusing the cooperation to all phases of preparedness, starting from, from, from the research, foresight, including training and exercises, planning, implementation and, uh, and uh, assessment at the end of the process. Mm. So this could be, for example, some, some future areas. That's great. We're looking forward to that. Uh, Camilla, the same question goes to you. What do you see from your perspective? Well, as it is a worrisome and very complex uh, risk uh, landscape right now, I think the cooperation between Sweden and Finland will become even more important in the future. Um, I think the word concrete is a word uh, used a lot here today. 
And I hope also that the cooperation we have with Finland will become even more concrete in the future. And for instance, we're talking about and uh, investigating on how to have uh, common stockpiling, for example, or take other measure measurements for strengthening security supply uh, that we can do together. Um, we share a situational awareness uh, report or picture, and we now try to do it in a more um, secure with the secure technology solutions, so it will become much more easy for us. And uh, to give a third example, uh, we're also investigating an, or, or want to have a secondation staff from MSB at the Swedish um, uh, embassy here in Helsinki uh, as a concrete example of how we can strengthen mm. the cooperation. I think mm. that would be very fruitful. Mm. So um, um, concrete is the word for today, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that the fact that concrete is the word today also really stressed that we are ready for taking the next yes. stage in our bilateral cooperation. Sure. With that said, I uh, please join me in thanking Camilla, Deputy Director General at the Swedish Civil Continuous Agency, and Petri Korvala, Secretary General of the Security Committee here in Finland. Now it's time for, uh, by no doubt, the biggest highlight of today, and that is to leave the floor to uh, Gunvor Kronman and to Hans Wallmark to celebrate this year's participants of the program. Please, the floor is yours. So, thank you, thank you all for all your contributions today, but today, the highlight, as we heard, is really to give the diplomas to this year's Anaulman Initiative participants. Uh, I'm very delighted to hear that uh, there are many plans of taking the uh, cooperation and uh, the, uh, also building the resilience together, also in the cognitive resilience areas. Uh, uh, Erika Brundin from the Swedish Church was uh, talking about, which is one very important aspect. Uh, I'm looking forward to next year's uh, results uh, and to have a new group here uh, doing the same kind of commitments. But these, with these words, uh, I will give the floor to the chairperson of our advisory committee, Hans Wallmark, uh, please. Thank you so much. It, it has really been a, a great summit, uh, and it's also going to be an honor to now uh, hand over the, the diplomas. Uh, I think this is really a role model, as uh, the Deputy Secretary General mentioned, that, uh, I mean, what we can achieve here between the Republic of Finland and the Kingdom of Sweden is, is a role model for many other countries in the European Union and NATO. And I'm also... Well, I'm waiting for the day when Sweden have entered NATO, but I'm, I'm, I'm really a strong advocate for also cooperation between EU and NATO. Sometimes it's extremely odd that the that the, that it's uh, the whole globe minus two kilometers between the Commission and the NATO HQ in Brussels, and I think that we as Swedes and Finns can do a lot on that. Uh, to conclude with this summit, uh, well, we have not only in Sweden the Jas Gripen and we know the Eurovision, we, we have also a kingdom. Uh, so um, at least the Queen Elizabeth had said to summarize this summit, we are very pleased. Thank you. <laughs> So I will now call name by name uh, the participant to come up here and receive the diploma uh, and the chair will uh, uh, give this diploma to you. So we start with Per Arvidsson. Kaisa Myrberg. Erika Brundin. <laughs> 
Felix Nolte. Mauri Etelämäki. Mirva Ojala. Alexi Friberg. Patrick Salino. Jarna Hartikainen. Fredrik Steini. Anders Henningsson. Peter Sund. Oh. Rickard Sandborn. Marine Holm Johansson. Matthias Thompson. Pekka Huokuna. Arro Toivonen. Jarno Ilme. Tapio Tähtinen. Osa Riikka Joukio. Så en varm stor applåd för årets kurs. And now lunch is deserved. It's served in the restaurant. Thank you. Yeah, and we deserve it.